Good. Good. Welcome. Hey, are we here? Yeah, we're here, dude. Dude. Hey, first of all, thanks for having me again. Thank you. I appreciate it. It's uh, it's an honor to have you in here. Man, it's nice. I was I, I was meaning to uh, try to take a selfie with you when you got here because a couple months ago my daughter hit me up and you know she's twenty one going on twenty two and she goes, Dad, do you know Oliver Peck? And I'm like, Yeah, we know each other. She goes, I just binge watched all of Ink Master on I guess it came on uh, Netflix at some point and she was like nerding out about you and being in Dallas and all this type of shit like that. So I was going to send her, and I completely forgot till we just hit live. <laughs> well, I mean, remind me. We, we will do it. it. All right. I'm very easily uh, reachable. Yeah, yeah. I'm I mean, on the street every day. Yeah. <laughs> you don't know if you're on the street or you're just on the street, right? I, it's like people come in the shop, and they're like, I can't believe you're here. And I'm like, I work here. <laughs> I'm here every day. <laughs> well, it's more odd that you're here. I'm always here. <laughs> It has got to be the weird thing about it, right? Yeah. Fame in, in a world like these type of worlds that you're into is it's different, isn't it? Like, not. I mean, I'm I'm like, I'm like, a little famous. Yeah, yeah. I know people that are famous. That's what I'm saying. Have like, like a different life. Like I still can go to the store. Yeah. And people are like, oh hey, and I'm like high five. You know, no big deal. Yeah. But yeah. uh, you know. You see, I just saw recently there's like a there's like a video, an interview with Brad Pitt, mm -hmm. and uh, they ask him they're asking him some questions, and he's like, "Yeah, whatever, whatever, whatever," and he's just being, you know, whatever. And then they ask him like, "What would you do?" You might have seen this. What would you do if you could be invisible for a day? And the second they say it, he's it just like. He just like goes into it, and he it like you can see it emotionally hits him. Yeah, and he's just like he thinks about it, and he's just like, man, and, he, and he's like, thanks for a second. He's like, I probably just you know, walk down the street and look at things, <laughs> and you're just like, yeah, because you can't just walk down the street and look at things, you know what I mean? He can do a lot of things that we cannot do. Yeah, yeah. He can afford to do anything that we can't do. But the simple things, he cannot yeah. do it. You know, he, he can. And that's like, is it worth Isn't, it? I, I read something like, I think Michael Jordan once said that he used to ride motorcycles a lot because of the... Because he could wear a full-face helmet, nobody knows him. Exactly. And I think that maybe for some of the actors, it kind of came into that same way that you can kind of have a little bit of uh, privacy through a motorcycle and a helmet yeah. than, you know, running around and stuff like that. But I couldn't imagine. I mean... I don't think I'd want that life at all, but that's kind of far fed. It's like if you were a millionaire kind of yeah. idea conversation. Well, they're talking the other day. They're talking about all these kids trying to get famous on TikTok or whatever, and yeah. just getting famous, but without getting rich. It's like mm. fame without money is the worst thing in the world. Yeah, you know, you'd rather have the money without the fame if you had to pick one or the other. Most people assume that fame comes with money as well. Like they just assume if you're very a lot of broke famous people exactly that's what i'm saying like they think because you're on a on a scale of like notoriety of some sort that you just there's automatically some financial benefit to that and it's not i mean social media is a perfect example of that so you know what i mean but this is like weird like social media fame versus like the fame of all the other ways that people have got to that that level just it's like hard to they're both the they're both real but they feel very different you know what i'm yeah. saying i would say the to me, what what I enjoy about whatever, you know, it's it's kind of weird to talk about yourself being famous. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's yeah. like, I'm like, I'm just a fucking dumbass kid. You yeah. know what I mean? But I just, uh, I realized that, you know, I've got some, whatever it is, some, some notoriety, some fucking people know me, I'm recognizable, whatever the case is. But um, for me, I'm like, I'm known for just being myself, mm -hmm. which I like. Like, I'm not pretending to be anybody I'm not. I'm not, like, when people meet me, they meet me, they meet Oliver. I'm the same guy. I high-five and hug everybody. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I'm not, like, the unobtainable, crazy, famous person that you see and you just lose your fucking mind over, you know? And it's like, uh, you know, it's just, it's a, that's a, I wouldn't want that. Mm. I feel like that's the way you want to go about it, though. You don't ever want to have this 
you know, because a lot of people, like a lot of actors, their fame is attached to a role they played, and yeah. so someone's like eyes for that, like they want that that person that they fell, you know, they yeah. admired through the movie role they played or whatever. So when you see you get to meet an actor that's just yeah. a, a normal person, like they might not really have the personality that you expected or whatnot, but you know, well, like you know, I've. I'm guilty. I meet actors. I've met people in my life or whatever, mm -hmm. and I instantly think about that character or that role that yeah, I love yeah. so much. I know nothing about that person in real life. You know, there's very few famous people that I know anything about them personally at all. Yeah. Other than like Dave Navarro that I'm close with, mm -hmm. you know, and a few other, and a few people like Norman Reedus and stuff. But um, I just, that's just like when we were born free a few years ago and Brad Pitt was there. Oh shit, he was. Yeah, and every <laughs> and like within a few minutes, you know, Born Free's big, yeah. ten thousand people. Within a few minutes, everybody in the park knew that Brad Pitt was there. Mm. So everybody's like, "Oh my god, oh my god!" And so people just started like, as the whispers, like, "You prep is here, prep is here." Prep. People started trying to run around, find out where he was or whatever. Mm. And within a, within twenty minutes, he just had to leave because it was people just got too crazy. Yeah, I mean, like, if you, as a person there, and you find out that that person is there, then what how, What do you expect to get out of that? I, you just want to, I, I will say this. I was like, cool, he's into motorcycles. That's badass. I knew that he knows Max Schaff, mm -hmm. and, I knew, and, and I knew that he was, he had, like, at some point he had, a, he saw Max and had a conversation with Max, but then he got bombarded by a bunch of people and that. But I was like, I saw him from... I don't know, very far away. Yeah. You know, but f close enough that I could tell it was him. Mm -hmm. Maybe 60 yards. I don't know. Like the distance. I'm not good at judging, <laughs> but it was far. Yeah. Too far to yell and him hear me, but far enough for me to recognize that it was his face. And I was like, when I heard that he was there, I was like, that's cool. And I think nothing of it. I mean, yeah. I was like, whatever. You know, there's, and then when I saw him, dude, I was like, <laughs> it's it what? fucking, yeah. it was just like, you're just like, there he is, you know. <laughs> I didn't get close enough to talk to him or whatever, but I could see you would just be like, uh, 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 uh. You yeah, know I, I mean? wonder. I mean, I, I haven't been that close to someone of that cal caliber of fame or whatever, or even someone that I put on that category myself, right? But I, I don't know how I would act in that situation either, you know what I mean? Or how I would uh, take, you know. I mean, I saw, I told the story the other day, I saw a fucking, uh, a long time ago, probably 15 years ago, I saw Keanu Reeves at a bar, mm -hmm. at a restaurant, bar, the restaurant, bar at a restaurant we were going to eat at, and you hang out the bar before you get your table or whatever. Keanu Reeves is at the bar. Mm -hmm. We walk in, it's a long time ago, 20, 15 plus years ago, whatever. And as soon as I saw him, I went, Utah! You know, and it's like, I'm the asshole yeah. that yells out fucking <laughs> the character or whatever. And he just like, with his glass goes, he says, I, not to me, but loud enough to where the people he was sitting with, he's like, assholes everywhere you go. And he just turned back around. And I thought it was funny. Yeah. I wasn't mad at him, you know, it's just, but it was just like, you know, yeah, I am the asshole. Yeah, I'm a loud, obnoxious kid. Yeah, but that's the price you pay. Yeah. You yeah. know, if, if you're going to be in a movie, then people are going to recognize you for it. And that's what you have to do. Yeah. You know, yeah. and I was like, I didn't think two seconds about seeing Keanu Reeves, which I thought, I mean, I loved him in a bunch of movies, especially Point Break. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But, uh, yeah, it's got certain be. people that I've met are like, I mean, I've had people come in a true tattoo in Hollywood and get tattooed that are famous people, and it's just cool to meet them and they're nice. But then, like, there's just that, then there's that next level. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, if, if Al Pacino walked in, it'd be way different <laughs> than like, yeah, you know, whoever else. But it was pretty. I was. I that was the moment I realized, like, oh, this is way different. Yeah, even yeah. at that distance. Do you think there's a difference between the way some people act between like musicians that are on that level of super high fame and actors? You know what I mean? Or does it kind of? I think it just depends cross... on. I think it depends on your own personal emotional attachment to it. Because mm. there's, um. If it's like your favorite band and you listen to them all the time, you like feel in sync, you mm. know, and then you see them and you're just like, oh my God, I love it. But then you could meet somebody in a band, you don't even know the name of the band, you don't really care. Yeah. You I, know, it's I the, know the level of fame isn't the the, the measure. I it's, think the level of 
emotional your personal attachment connection, you have yeah. to that person makes the difference. Mm, that makes sense. You yeah. know, um, <clears throat> I fly a bunch over the last 20 years and I see, I've been on the plane with, you know, I've been on the plane with Sean Penn before and it was just cool to see him. Yeah. You know, I didn't get a photo with him or anything, but it was cool as if there he was, whatever, Yeah, you know, but then there's like certain people that you like just love. Like I love Steve Buscemi. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, man, I wouldn't, you know, I was like, people were like, oh, if I, you know. So a couple of years ago we were at this, uh, we were at this awards banquet thing mm -hmm. that was for, uh, it was for the internet content awards. And we were in, we were in New York filming the show and the, the network people were like, Hey, there's this awards deal tonight. Paramount has a table. We want to, do y'all want to go? And Chris and Dave were like, I'm not going. And I was like, well, I mean, if you want me to go, I'll go. Like, yeah. what, why not? You know, it'd be fun. I got nothing, you know, whatever. And so they're like, cool. So I was like, I'll, if y'all buy me a suit, I'll go. Cause I didn't have a suit with me. Mm -hmm. So there's a suit place in Jersey around the corner. It's like a, kind of like a ghetto hood suit place. So you can get like, a, I got like a plaid suit and had it tailored okay. or whatever. And I Kings went over there. comedy suit. Got a, yeah, I got a suit real quick and gave it the peewee cut. I call it the peewee cut. Get the high water and tight yeah. taper and all that. And look like, you know, kind of a. Uh -huh. So I get the suit and I go to this party. And I'm sitting at the table with a couple other people that are on Paramount shows. And that, you know, I don't really know who. Mm -hmm. They were beforehand or whatever. But Adam Sandler mm -hmm. was getting an award because he had just signed that deal. You know, he's got all those Netflix movies. Yeah, yeah. He had just signed the deal and made one of those movies so far. And it was like a big deal because it was the biggest actor streaming movie contract or whatever. It's like kind of, you know, he's like a big actor is leaving the studios and going to make movies for Netflix. It was like this internet. Yeah, so he yeah. got this award for it. Well, he had chosen Steve Buscemi to present the award. Yeah. And so he's at the table with Steve Buscemi. And we're like, we're at this table, and there's that table. And I look over, and it's Steve Buscemi. And I'm like, holy shit. I mean, there's a ton of people at this thing. Yeah. You know, it's a red carpet, you know, all these actors everywhere. And I was like, I mean, there were, like, David Letterman on there. That was pretty cool. But Steve Buscemi, dude, I was like, oh, my God, Steve Buscemi. And I'm like. It's Donnie, it's Donnie, you know? And I was just like, <laughs> and uh, so I'm at the table, like totally nerding out about, and so the girl that works for Paramount, she was like, there's like a, they did half the show and there's an intermission. Mm -hmm. and everybody goes to the bar and she's like, would you like to meet Mr. Bashimi? And I was like, well, hell yeah. Yeah. So we get up and we go over by where he's at. And he was still sitting at the table and everybody else had gotten up and was mingling, but he was just like sitting there eating. Yeah. Snacks and drinking his drink. He didn't give a fuck or whatever. So we walk over and she goes, Oh, Mr. Bashimi, I'd like to introduce you to Mr. Peck, blah, blah, blah. And he was like, Oh, and he stood up and he was real friendly. And I was definitely like, Hey, nice to meet you. But I didn't Yeah. I didn't have a lot to say. Yeah, like where do you go with that conversation? I was just like, Man, it's just nice to meet you. And he was like, Oh, cool, you know, and I shook his hand and he was, you know, funny and he like cracked some, you know, cracked some wise yeah. Fucking crack and like was smiling and just being like little. And he was made it comfortable for you to be in yeah. that situation. And then he yeah. goes, and he was just like, Would you like to get a photo? You know, and I was like, Well, yeah. And like, I know from his point of view, he's like, I'm going to take a photo with this person and then they're going to leave me alone. I can go back to doing what I'm going to do. But I'm like, Sure. So the girl that takes over there, she takes my phone and I'm like, I go to stand next to him to take this photo. And he goes, He just turns around and Adam Sandler's talking to all these people over here. He goes, Yo, Adam. Come get in this photo. Oh, shit. And I was like, in, at first, I was like, oh, man. I just wanted a photo with just me and <laughs> me and Steve Buscemi or whatever. Uh, but I love Adam Sandler. Yeah, yeah who does well. But I was just like, oh, it's kind of weird. But then Adam, like, turns around and, like, walks towards us. And, he's, and he gets up close, and he just goes, what's up, Oliver? Boom. And, like, gives me this fucking, like little cool little hand slap boom boom blow it up fucking damn and i was just like and then i was like like really like shaking yeah so in the photo i'm like Ur! you know like <laughs> and then we leave and i was like to the girl that worked for Paramount, i was like oh my god adam sandler knows who i am yeah he knows my name and she just looked at me like i'm an idiot and she goes everybody knows who you are <laughs> but in my mind i'm just this yeah, fucking yeah. kid that was in this room for 
you know, with all these people that I didn't fit in with. Because I don't really fit in with that. Deal. Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, he knew who I was. Yeah, it's got to feel amazing, though. And so I don't know. I feel like he knew who I was, but I don't think Steve Buscemi knew who I was. Yeah. You know what I mean? Steve yeah. Buscemi's probably not got his finger on the pulse as much as... Yeah, Adam does. Adam does. But it was really cool. And they were, and it was a few minutes of just talking to him, and then, I, you know... That's always the weirdest thing. Not not on that level of, like, like an actor like that, but just... Just in the motorcycle industry, from my perspective, whenever, oh, man, that's the guy that, you know, that's Arlen Ness. You know, at one point, I remember that conversation, how awkward it was the first time. It's just you you want to make your presence known to the person. Yeah. You know, like, kind of like selfishly or, or kind of like, you know, whatever. I want that guy to know me, really. Yeah. It, it sounds super egotistical to say, but in, in this thing of trying to grow in the motorcycle industry, I'm like, well, shit, I'd like to introduce myself to this guy and meet them, blah, blah, blah. But you don't really ever have much of a conversation to strike right afterward. It's usually some surface level like, so, man, you like choppers? <laughs> you know? Oh, man. It just kind of like falls flat on its face after that. You know what I mean? I met Sugar Bear this year at uh, oh, at um, at the, the party in uh, Sturgis. And uh, same thing. Like, I knew him. But yep. off the top of my head, I had not – I did not have a full-blown layout of, like – real thoughtful questions or sentiments to give to this guy. It was just yeah, more yeah. like, there you are, dude. <laughs> like, yeah. I met him at the, uh, at the chopper fest. Yeah. 2019, the one that's out in like, I guess it's Santa Barbara area. Yeah. Uh, and he was super nice. Yeah, He's, he's really just nice. meeting everybody. And I, and I'm like, I wanted to meet him, but I've got nothing in his world. Mm -hmm. I've gotten nothing to impress him with yeah you know yeah I mean? hey here's my motorcycle you want to check it out you yeah, know what yeah. i mean like but no i mean he was just super nice it was cool to meet him and it was cool to see you know someone like him just checking out bikes and meeting people and being friendly and he's just real he's like a sweet dude what about like your relationship with guys like norman Reedus that actually ride motorcycles is there more of a common conversation around the bike to where it feels more natural like you're just hanging out with another dude on a motorcycle you know you meet you, some people you meet and it's it's whatever and some people you meet and you just click instantly yeah. and i met i met norman at a fucking sailor jerry event i remember you talked you talked about it the was first just, one, yeah. we were it was like it was just like we were buddies mm -hmm. you know and then we stayed in touch and and you know seen him you know, when I was in the, whenever I was in New York, I'd be like, "Hey, I'm in New York for whatever months or whatever." And he's like, "Oh, cool." Well, and we'd get together a couple times. You know, not a lot. Yeah, you know, yeah. A couple times, once a year or something, and and you know, kind of like one of those things where something comes up that's relevant, we'll fucking chat. And then mm -hmm. he did that show. Yeah. And he's like, "Hey, would you like to be on an episode of Ride?" And I was like, "Well, fuck yeah, of course, yeah. like whatever." And so that was um, really cool. Um, and then he did an epic, he did a season, he did some when he went over to Japan and rode. Mm -hmm. And I was like, he was like, man, you should come over to Japan when we're going to do the show and ride with us. And I was like, yes, let me yeah. know. And then it did, I couldn't do it. The time didn't happen. I couldn't do it. But he's just, uh, and then the thing we're going to talk, one of the things we're going to talk about today is this we can new roll movie. Into that. Yeah. This new movie, man. He's in this, uh, he's in the bike riders movie. Yeah. And, uh. His I, character role is pretty wild, like yeah, yeah. The, hey, how he transformed into that yeah. dude, you know? I mean, his character's name is Funny Sonny, uh -huh. and he's right, and he's the bike he rides in the movie is one of my bikes, mm -hmm. and so that was fucking cool. Yeah. Um, but I kind of, uh, I kind of helped nudge uh, him getting into that movie in yeah. some respect. Like when the when Jeff Nichols first got. The sign off from Danny Lyon to make this movie. Mm -hmm. um, for those of you who are listening, there's a movie coming out yeah. called The Bike Riders. It's based on Danny Lyon's book from the late 60s called The Bike Riders. And it's uh, based in true events. You, know, you see a movie yeah. based in true events. Obviously, the story has been dramatized for yeah. a cinematic feature because in the book, it's mostly photos, but mm -hmm. then there's a bunch of interviews. And so the characters in the movie are based on the characters in the interviews. Mm -hmm. um, and a little bit of stories from those interviews have been put into the movie, but the overall story arc is yeah. is a script that was written mm -hmm. based on those characters. So, it, but um, I was like, "Hey, man, I know he knows who Danny Lyon is. I know he rides motorcycles. I know he's into it." I was like, "Hey, my buddy, 
is making this movie mm-hmm. about the bike riders, it'd be fucking, you should tell your people yeah. to be on the fucking lookout to get in this movie or whatever. And he was like, oh, cool. But you can imagine someone like some famous movie star getting told, my buddy's doing this. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, who's your buddy? Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Is it fucking Ridley Scott? Is it, you know, <laughs> who's your fucking buddy, right? Um, but, uh, so that kind of like, and then I told me and Jeff Nichols, Ben Nichols from Lucero's brother, we and me, Ben, and Jeff, you know, he's been talking about wanting to make this movie for 10 years. Wrote the script, and then it took five years after he wrote the script to get Danny Lyon to read it and sign off on it. Mm. And then it took five years, or how the timeline might be, that might be exactly right, but it took years to get him to sign off. And then it took more years to get a studio behind it and put money on it. Mm. You know, so all that stuff is like, it's just been swirling around, waiting to happen for a long time. We've been talking about it forever. So Jeff Nichols is the one that's directing the movie, right? Yeah. So he how's... wrote and directed the movie. Okay, that's good that he wrote it. So he has much more of a connection to yeah. it. Then, how? What's your relationship with him? How, how did John meet? Well, Ben Nichols is the singer of the band Lucero, uh-huh. which I go on tour with a lot. And Ben, fucking I don't know, fifteen more years ago, wrote a song called Bike Riders mm. based on the book. Um, couple years later his brother wrote this started writing a screenplay based on the book and uh i've just known you know me and ben do a tour every Mm -hmm. year called the bike riders tour yeah based because we call it because he's got a song called bike riders we're riding bikes on a tour we call it bike riders tour and then now there's a movie called bike riders but we've been talking about it and i've known jeff for probably you know over a decade Mm -hmm. and we've just been talking about if this movie gets made this movie gets made and i was like dude you got to get if you make this movie, you got to get Norman Reedus in the movie because he's a fucking badass actor, badass character, and he really rides. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a lot of actors that that ride, but do they really ride? Do they yeah, own a yeah. motorcycle or do they really ride? You know, um, you also need like the a balance of just great actors to yeah. kind of balance out the thing. If if you just filled it up, I, I'm assuming if you just filled it up with everybody in Hollywood that rides a motorcycle, it might not be the right fit. You know yeah. what I mean? I mean, there was a lot of actors wanted to be in this movie mm. because of the connection to the to the book mm. you know brad pitt wanted to be in the movie and uh there was some talk at some point about him being in it and it just didn't pan out yeah. timeline and contract wise and it just didn't pan out um but from what i understand the interest brad pitt's interest in the movie helped give the movie a springboard to like start oh, okay. getting attention and then when the Brad Pitt didn't didn't, think hang, didn't pan out, um, Christian Bale was on the block about maybe he wanted to be in Damn. it, which also helped the movie get some traction. Then Christian Bale didn't work out. And then they signed the kid, Austin Butler, yeah. that ended up being in the movie Elvis. But they kind of got, they kind of swooped in and got Austin Butler right yeah. before he was. Yeah, you know, on that rise, yeah. You know, before he, if they would have, like now, after Elvis came out, Austin Butler's yeah. ticket prices raised, but they got him before that. So they, okay. they got him signed in. And then uh, Tom Hardy came yeah. on the block. And that, he rides too, right? He does ride. He had never ridden the Harley Davidsons before, yeah. but he rides Triumphs. And I think he has, I think he owns Triumphs. Yeah. Um, and he's in, he's in like a, a group of people that ride in England, and he's part owner of that. The bike mm. shed. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. You know the bar, motorcycle yeah. theme bar, but it's all Euro sport type stuff. But um, he transitioned in a heartbeat. Like mm-hmm. one day, he, like he showed up on set, and one day he was riding like it was nothing. Mm. You know, just put him on a pinhead, and he's ready to go. Yeah, um, it wasn't bitching bike, at all. <laughs> the bike he rides in the movie is my '55 pinhead. Oh, okay. That's pretty fucking cool, too. So you and Milburn basically provided a lot of the well, bikes. Well, M- Milburn. I may, I connected Milburn and Jeff Nichols. Okay. Um, again, the same story. I told Jeff Nichols, like, hey, you make this movie, my buddy mm. can do the fucking stunts and the motorcycles. And he's like, yeah, 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 you got a buddy. We all got buddies, whatever. But Milburn actually is a fucking stunt guy. Okay. He's actually worked on tons of movies. He had just gotten done with doing the Ford versus Ferrari movie. Okay. And in movies, Milburn's IMDb is stacked. Yeah. He's with, done a lot of stuff for the film. Just yeah, I mean, he's driven. Commercials and stuff. Yeah, a ton of so. commercials. But he's uh, he did, like, Iceman and 
Arlington Road and Machete yeah. and I mean it's just like movies, 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 and then big movies like Ford vs Ferrari and uh, so when I really finally told Jeff Nichols like, dude, you gotta check out Jeff, you gotta check out Jeff Milburn, and I sent him this link to his IMDb, and instantly Jeff was like, Nichols was like, oh my god, this yeah. guy's serious, legit. I'm like, I told you, <laughs> you know, but it's like, yeah, I got a buddy. Yeah, oh, yeah. I need a motorcycle painted. I got a buddy painted a motorcycle. Yeah, yeah. Sure you do, right? Yeah, yeah. You know the story. Yeah, tattoo. Yeah, I got yeah, a buddy. I got tattoos. a buddy. I got a buddy. In his kitchen. So it ended up working out, and Jeff got the job. He's the stunt coordinator in charge of all the motorcycles, and there was like two stunt coordinators. One was like, because there's fight scenes, so there's yeah. like a, most stunt coordinators are fight people, mm -hmm. and then some are driving people, but there's nobody else really in the film industry that has done stunt coordination on a high level that also can deal with antique motorcycles. Mm. It just doesn't exist. They're all people that have, you know, done Fast and Furious, and yeah, yeah, those fucking people can't kickstart panheads, yeah. keep them running in a Cincinnati winter. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can imagine how much work it is to keep fifty panheads running <laughs> every day on a movie set. Like every day, you got to work on something. Every day, one bike's going to have something. Scheduling going on. like time frames with all your actors and all your people. Yeah. Like that, that's got to be. And so bike, was that a pain in the ass? Yes. Okay. I mean, Milburn had the fucking. It was a um, probably one of the hardest jobs in you know winter time in Cincinnati. So you're talking about some pretty cold weather there. Dude, there's a there's a. I get to ride the. I get to ride a bike in some scenes, and uh, depending on how the final edit comes out, there might be a scene where you see me. Yeah. That you can tell if you're looking for me, you can see me. But there's going to be some scenes where like some bikes come down the road and like turn right. I'm like that third headlight. Yeah. That's me. But we're riding motorcycles and. And it's fucking 2 a.m., 19 fucking degrees, <laughs> November, early December in fucking Cincinnati. Mm -hmm. When it's did this film? Crazy. Uh, they finished filming in December. Of this year? And then it comes out December 1st. Okay. Um, yeah, the movie released on December 1st. We were, me and some buddies were in Austin in December and at the White Horse Saloon or something in, in, in East Austin. And this chick, this kind of like, you know, Austin chick kind of walks up to us and she can, I guess she, the way we dress kind of gave off biker or whatever. Yeah. She goes, oh, y'all, I, I work in the film industry a lot and we're just like, whatever, you know. And next thing you know, she tells us about the bike riders movies. Like, I just worked on some of that up there. And I'm like, what is this? Like, that's how yeah. I found out that this whole thing was getting made. And then it started to kind of reveal itself through other, other channels. But, you know, what's funny about you being in the movie because I... Commented, I don't know if it was on Dozer's post or yours, but I was talking to Dozer at uh, at the the Motorcycles is Art thing in, in Buffalo Chip, and he told us two stories about you on set filming on the on the the bike riders thing, where obviously this thing's all done in film, right? So they're shooting all this yeah. whole thing in film. It's got that vibe, that kind which of which is fucking badass. Yeah, Jeff Nichols, director, like made that stance. To yeah, like, let's make a real movie. Let's have real motorcycles put it on film and you have to you have to barter that with the studio because yeah. they don't want to spend that extra money exactly it's a lot more money to put it on film than it is put it on digital mm -hmm. and when you put that film cartridge in a camera you got three minutes yeah that's a big difference so he told us I'll tell him the first one right now y'all are all riding in I guess you're the third headlight <laughs> and you drop your toothpick out of your mouth and so you stop the bike <laughs> While they're filming, <laughs> and get off and walk around and pick up your toothpick and just go carry on like, not like stay in character. Like, nope, stop the bike. <laughs> Can't live without that toothpick. There dude. you go. And then <laughs> I think the other one was funny too, but it, it, it's like hey, a, addiction is real, dude. <laughs> addiction is real. Addiction is real. If I mean, I feel like everybody's addicted to something. Yeah. There's you know whatever whatever it is. Yeah. But uh, I'm lucky that the toothpick is my worst one. That's good. Yeah. And motorcycles. <laughs> and motorcycles. And then he said this other one uh, where you guys were walking up to a house and kind of greeting people or what whatnot, and he went up to fist bump somebody in a 1960s movie and like, period piece. And can't fist bump. Yeah. <laughs> and it's just like, it's one of those kind of things where you got to think about that for a minute. Yeah. Like, why why is that why is that funny? It's like, oh, because this is a period piece yeah. movie. Yeah, you can't fist bump it. That, <laughs> and that was pretty funny because it, in that scene – it was also kind of like uh, 
They're like, hey, come on in and meet everybody kind of thing, yeah. right? And then we did it. And when I'm, you know, me and this one particular person, we had just met. And we, hey, what's up, man? You know? And then when it came time to film it, it just was the exact, we had just done it. So it was yeah. like just the same <laughs> thing. And they're like, can't do that. And I'm like, oh, I'm glad they caught that. Yeah, yeah right? you can't think about it. But some, one of the, one of the AD team people were just like, hey, hey, you know, yelled out, whatever, but. It was pretty funny. So it came. Did, a, it became a joke, you know. It got it got mentioned more than more than once for sure. Um, did throughout this whole process, did you get to meet Danny Lyon at all, or was he? You know, I I did not get to meet Danny Lyon. He mm-hmm. did come on. I was on uh, set multiple times over mm-hmm. the course of the filming. Like I went for a week and I came home and I went back for another week and a half and I went I went back. I don't know how many times I went back and forth, but. Um, he was on set a few times, but I missed him. Mm. There was one, I think there was one or two days that overlapped. I was there at the same time, but we were, the locations were different and he wasn't, you know, I didn't, I didn't get to mm. meet him. Um, but everybody said he was really cool and that he was just, he was pretty, pretty excited that the movie was getting made. Mm. Um, but it's pretty true from his point of view, from if you look at the way the, the book was made. Yeah. That they keep that character in the movie. Like, there's an actor that plays Danny Lyon, and he's photographing. He's inter and they, yeah, he's yeah. interviewing the people. He's walking around with this little walkie, and you know, with the little thing, and interviewing people. And uh, so it's there is enough of true life in the movie to to give it that reverence, to give it that, you know. Yeah, but it, I mean, if you read the book, like some of the first couple of interviews were kind of. Like they were kind of seemed like they were all over the place, mm-hmm. and then as you as you get towards the end of the book, it kind of starts to hone in mm-hmm. on a few main characters that and tell just it. how the club started and yeah, who yeah. went down and who blah 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 blah. But in the preview, you know, the preview looks killer. Yeah, it does. And they got the Rolling Stones song in there. It's badass. It's just like it's it looks so great. And you know, the whole time, you know, Jodie Comer's character. It's like talking, like, mm-hmm. and and that's kind of introducing, and she's literally quoting. Yeah, I remember the interviews. Yeah, you know, and so that's how she got her. She listened to those because they got the original tapes. Oh hell yeah! To that's listen cool. to, so the actors got to listen to those tapes. She got to listen to that tape, and that's how she got that voice and the character, mm. you know. And she's like saying the things that are in that, you know, on those tapes. No, that's cool. You know, like yeah. and like five weeks later, I married him. You know. <laughs> uh, but yeah, as soon as the preview dropped, man, a lot of buzz, you know. Yeah, and, and I, I didn't know if like maybe the lack of promotion was just due to the writer and the actor strike, strike and stuff the like strike, that. Strike, man, they can't. Nobody. I mean, the studio mm-hmm. can obviously put a trailer out. Yeah. But no actor can promote. Like, you know, I just talked. I just did a deal. Just did a recorded a podcast with Norman Reedus last week, mm-hmm. and we couldn't talk about the movie. Oh, because he's in it. He's like, yeah. I'm not allowed to talk about the movie. I can't promote anything. But I can talk about it. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? I'm not SAG. Uh, <laughs> so the lack of, like, the the grassroots promotion of the movie is 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 hurting. But I went and saw a movie uh, a couple nights ago, and it was the preview. It was on the big screen. Mm. And, dude, it was so cool. Hell, yeah. I'm excited for you. I mean, I think that, like, I mean, for multiple reasons, I feel like we could use a good motorcycle. We needed something. We need our version of a motorcycle movie for our for this and time it frame. It looks fucking yeah. great. It's a. I mean, I love period piece movies anyway. Yeah, you know what I mean. It looks great. Um, the characters are fucking good. You know, the characters in real life were interesting, and they based the characters on that. You know, and just the look of it is fucking really cool and. Jeff Nichols is such a passionate director. I think it's also interesting. I mean, obviously the book kind of does this, but, you know, for someone to pick something up that's not a California-based Hells Angels kind of concept movie, it's based on another club and a different type of camaraderie between the clubs, actually, that was taking place in that time. So, And that's kind of, I guess, the hard part, too, is it, the club stuff always sells, right? Yeah. It's always like Sons Anarchy. Yeah, it's always gonna sell. I mean, you look at motorcycle content on YouTube and anything club related is through the roof. It's like it's it's, it's like the fantasy. It's the fantasy, right? Yeah. 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 It's way. like the the outlaw dream, you know, like 
it's the Jesse James. It's the it's the Tombstone. Yeah. It's the you know all those things about outlaws are always yeah the most exciting you know and those characters are yeah and that's what uh, this movie kind of shows how regular people become that mm. you know because they're just dudes. Are any of the characters still alive? Like from the book that you know of? It's got to be uh, weird to like know there's a movie coming out and you're like I still mean, kicking. I would feel like some of them, at least one or two of them, would have to be. Yeah. You know, I mean, Danny Lyon's old. Yeah. I can't remember how old he is, but he was really happy that this was happening before he, while he's still here. Yeah. Yeah. It's the story that I heard that he's happy that it's happening before while he could see it happen. Mm. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It'd be interesting to know if uh, some of those actual characters that have that name. Mm-hmm. They, the names, some of the names are the same. Yeah. Johnny and Benny and Cockroach and all that. You know, it's... Uh, <laughs> uh, but I'm, I mean, I'm through the roof, man. I think it's so cool. Yeah. And uh, another thing, I just thought about this the other day when we were talking about it. I was like, dude, this is the largest real motorcycle film production ever. Yeah, I could see that. You know, I mean, what else? Yeah. I mean, there's great movies like Easy Riders, mm-hmm. which was like a shoestring budget with nobody in it mm-hmm. other than the two dudes that wanted to make it. You know what I mean? But it's like, there's never, and there's some cool chopper shit that's been put out in the last couple of years, but it's not ma- big money. Yeah. Big money, mainstream, real actors, real, you know, I mean, this is a quality fucking film, dude. Yeah. I mean, it's got some A list, I mean, Michael Shannon. You know, is dude Mike Shannon. I, I've been. I was there when he was there, and I didn't really get to meet him. He's not a, he's not a real. He's not the guy you're gonna meet and hang out with. Yeah, yeah. But him and Jeff Nichols are super tight. He's been mm. in every Jeff Nichols movie. Mm. Um, like Jeff Nichols' first movie, that movie Take Shelter, mm-hmm. is Mike Shannon. It's very few characters. I don't know if you ever seen it. No, I haven't. No. But it's uh, Mike Shannon. It's like the main dude, and this that's a pretty old movie. But it's it's like, uh, and then Mike Shannon's just been in every movie ever made. It's funny because uh, I watched uh, Eight Mile not too long ago. It just popped back up, and Michael Shan- Mike Shannon was uh, the guy that he went to high school in with. It so was so many movies, banging dude. his mom or something like he's that. He's in so many fucking movies. It's crazy. Yeah. Um, and he's so. I mean, I think. He's got a distinctive look and sound and feel to the way he acts. He's like when he was in what was that movie uh, with your boy uh, Bushimi, that that TV show, uh, Boardwalk Empire. He was so good in that. Yeah, yeah, so good in that. I think I think Mike Shannon is going to turn out to be like the the Gary Oldman or the Willem Dafoe of our generation. You know, I can see that because he can do like that movie Iceman. Mm -hmm. I mean, fucking. That's a great fucking movie. He just, he's so good. Mm. I mean, he's been in Superman. He's been in silly shows. He's been in serious movies. He's been in, like, small, Yeah, you know. He just stays movies. working. He's just great. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. This is probably the but biggest. But he did not want to ride a motorcycle. He didn't? No. Mm. They were like, because they wanted to put him on, they want to put his character on a bike in the movie, and he's like, I'm not riding a motorcycle. No. It's kind of like that whole kind of the, the story. That's what, that's what stunt doubles are for. Yeah. You know, there's the kind of actor that wants to do his own shit, and then there's the kind of actor that's like, I'm an actor. <laughs> I'm not riding a motorcycle. Like, Tom Hardy's like, I'm going to ride a motorcycle. Yeah, yeah. You know? And Austin Butler had never ridden a motorcycle before. Uh-huh. And he was fucking st- so stoked. He was like a fucking kid. Like yeah. a happy kid on Christmas with the new BMX bike, dude. He was just like... As I wonder much, how many people from his generation probably never really got inspired to ride motorcycles. You know. What well, saying? he was an actor from a child actor. Okay. And here's what I know about. I actually just talked about. I don't want to keep dropping Norma Reedus into this conversation, yeah. <laughs> but uh, just invite him over, dude. I mean, <laughs> this uh, we we're talking about it, and it's like when you're famous and you're an actor and you're doing this. There's like you're. It's not that you're not allowed to do things, but you're heavily discouraged mm-hmm. to not do a lot of things. They don't want you riding motorcycles. Mm-hmm. They don't want you doing that shit. You know what I mean? They don't want you fucking getting run over and getting fucked up, dude. Yeah. Because when you get to a certain level, like a Justin Bieber or a fucking Brad Pitt or a fucking whatever, it's not the fact that you're making $100 million. That's, you know, 
most of you don't care how much money you're making, but there's all these people mm -hmm. that you're their meal ticket. Yeah. So your agent, your manager, the studio, the fucking, you know, all these Everybody people that you else, employ, yeah. like, if you get, if, remember my motorcycle, all these people are fucked. Yeah. And so they care. Like, you can't, you know, they, they heavily coerce you not to do shit. Mm. And I, you know, talked to Norman about it. He's like, fuck that, I do whatever I want. Mm. You know, and he started, he was telling me how he started filming uh, Walking Dead. Mm -hmm. And he would sh ride his motorcycle to set. And they discouraged him or tried to tell him not to. And he's just like, whatever. Yeah. And then it ended up, they're like, one of the producers guy was like, hey, why don't we do a TV show where you ride motorcycles? And that's how he got the ride show. And it nice. fucking, but uh, pretty interesting. Yeah, you know? I find it. Yeah, super interesting. I, like you said, uh, the the biggest production of a motorcycle based movie. I mean, and and there's so there. I, I want to say there's a ton of great stories like the Danny Lyon book out there that you can that, that things like this, this might can be, be the the kickoff. Yeah, you know? for but, sure. There's going to be more that's going to spawn from this. Yeah, from different eras. Yeah, because yeah. you can do something from different eras and just look at the other kind of movie trends that have been out there. Like they made a movie about. You know Johnny Cash's life, and then the next like every year, Ray Charles's life and James yeah. Brown's life, and you know they yeah, like yeah. that's what's popular right now. Like biopics, you know. yeah, yeah, yeah. So hopefully it spawns some motorcycle enthusiasm. Yeah, and that's that's kind of what I was kind of alluding to. Is it like any time we can see motorcycles on a big screen or on TV, it it just like I said, it puts it in into more people's eyes that may never have been inspired to before. You know. Yeah, there's um, always movies like Mission Impossible. Where yeah, there's a motorcycle a scene or Fast and Furious with a motorcycle scene. And it's like, whatever motorcycle company gives them the most money, that's what bike they ride. Like yeah. they're on a Ducati or they're on a brand new Triumph or they're on a brand new BMW or whatever. And it's yeah. like, and it's always hokey as fuck. And you can always tell that it's all fake. And, you know, that one, they take the corner on the street and they're, and then they jump a curb and then the, they all, all of a sudden have dirt tires on. Yeah, yeah. You know those things. I hate yeah. that kind of shit. You know, the stunt double was just a little. My favorite good. movie of all time is Torque when they were stunt fighting the bikes. Oh, man. There's always so much crazy. <laughs> and anytime. In the dirt. There's like a, you know, there's like a chase or they're terrorist or, you know, where it's like they're trying to. I love when they're riding the really president. fast with no helmet and their eyes aren't watering. And then, but it's also, it's like. We need to send this team of people to go kill this guy in this armored car. They're not going to send some dirt bikes. Yeah. And then they just get run over, and you're like, yeah, of course. Yeah. Why wouldn't you send them in another armored car? Yeah. Then they could bash each other. Like, it's just always so crazy what they do with the unrealistic shit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, man, just to, to do a period piece where it's all real mm -hmm. antique motorcycles on the screen uh, is awesome. Mm -hmm. In a... It was a fight. For real? There was a there was a it was a tough fight between Jeff Nichols, Jeff Milburn against everyone else to, you know, wouldn't this just be easier if we just used new motorcycles? Yeah. You know? And yeah, it, that wouldn't look right though. And then we could just like paint them to look like old bikes, you know? And like, no, you can't do that. And so Jeff was Jeff Milburn was in charge, and he was particular. He's like, this movie takes place in this timeline. Yeah. That means there can be no master cylinder on the handlebar. Because mm. master cylinders didn't come on the handlebars until 1970-fucking-3. Oh, shit. You know what I mean? You can't have that big chunk of shiny fucking metal on the top of the handlebar. It'll yeah. stick out like a sore thumb, and anybody who knows on old motorcycles is going to be like, bullshit, as it rides yeah. by. You know so, what I mean? One of my good buddies, uh, we were we've been talking about back and forth about the movie, and we were actually just texting before this. I was telling him you were coming on, we were gonna talk about it, and he's like, he's like, I don't think it's gonna be super period piece, but or period correct as far as whatever, but you know, we've already it's a drama to to yeah. dramatization, whatever, but those kind of details are the things that I feel like a lot of people will miss in movies, right? Or like a a fight movie where they're just like completely getting hit in the face four hundred times and there's no <laughs> marks, you know what I'm saying? So there's like those aspects that I think that those small details, like what you're just mentioning with Jeff Mil uh, Milburn, that is going to please the purists out there. You know what I'm saying? Well, there's at the beginning, I'm not, this may not be a verbatim actual quote, but this is the gist. At the beginning of the movie, 
Jeff Nichols, the director, says to Jeff Milburn, the motorcycle stunt coordinator, it's like, Milburn, I'm counting on you to make sure that when this movie comes out, motorcycle people don't call bullshit. Mm. You know what I mean? It needs yeah. to look right. You know, so, you know, there's some stuff that you do and you can hide certain things with the, you know, camera, the angles. camera angles and whatever, but it needs to look fucking right. Yeah. You know, but the actors really need to be on the bikes. Otherwise, it's going to just look fake if you put them on process trailers and they're acting yeah. like they're riding with the fan blowing on them. And, yeah. you know, you, which what you see in like Pulp Fiction, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? It's either not really Bruce Willis or it's a fake fucking yeah. With the girl in the back, you know, and it, you can cut and do whatever, but you don't want to do CGI because this is an old it's movie. Film, yeah. You know, you want it to look good. And so, an actor, pretty boy Austin Butler, has to really ride this motorcycle with no helmet on, mm -hmm. even though you're not like doing eighty on the highway. Mm -hmm. You know, and and that's the other thing. People, are like, oh man, you get to ride motorcycles in a movie. It's gonna be. I'm like, there's not a whole. There's a lot of sitting around. Yeah. And then it's like, okay. All these bikes are going to come around this corner. So all the bikes sit right here, and then say go, and you ride around the corner and stop. And then you're going to ride down this street. So you sit here and wait and, like, ride down the street and stop. You don't just, like, yeah. go from here to the store and back. Yeah, it's a lot yeah. of You station. go from here to the end of the parking lot, and then from the parking lot around the corner, and then from the corner. You know, it's like yeah, yeah. there's no, like, long ride. There's no, like, real ride, and it's, like, just pew, 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 pew. Yeah. So all these old bikes – Having to get started a million times, having to sit there idle forever, fucking overheating, fucking burning out, fucking voltage regulators, fucking smoking clutches, for, you know all the, you know, just like every day, Everything. every day, bikes are on the lift. On how the lift, many, on the lift. how many panheads did y'all kind of a cure to? There's like fifty something bikes Damn. in the movie, and there's a few knuckleheads, a shitload of panheads, a couple of flatheads, a few shovel heads, um, and then some triumphs. I think there's a couple of there's one, at least one or two BSAs. Mm -hmm. um, in the book, there's a lot of triumphs. Triumphs. BSAs. That's what I was gonna say. Yeah. There's a lot. There's Harleys too, you know. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of triumphs. And a lot BSAs. of the racing was uh, the triumphs, so. though. And so they had in the original script. I'm not sure how the final edit's going to be. That there's a whole section of the movie that's about the races. Mm -hmm. But I think the budget didn't allow to like do a whole nother set, a whole nother go to the beach, a whole nother bunch of different bikes and a whole, you know, so there's, there's a little bit of racy stuff put in there, but it's not like yeah, some the main of the, story of them, like making Benny start back up later. Cause he's on a bigger bike, you know, and all this, yeah, cause yeah. it's a bunch of two fifties and, and he's on a bigger bike and they like, you know, the whole story. Yeah. If yeah. You remember it. Um, but, uh, I'm anxious to see the final complete movie. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. It's good that it's like only what two months away, yeah, essentially it's December first. Man, it's coming up quick. It you know what it, it premiered in Telluride mm -hmm. um, at the film festival what a month ago, mm -hmm. and it's gotten pretty good reviews. You know, there's always going to be negative reviews, but those people weren't going to like it anyway. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Like it's a motorcycle movie, dude. It's fucking. But it's as far even people that aren't into motorcycles, as far as a period piece goes, it's getting great reviews on how good it looks and the acting and mm -hmm. you know Tom Hardy is just amazing. Yeah. And uh, uh, you know people love Austin Butler, so there's gonna be a a lot of non motorcycle people that want to go see the movie because of that. Yeah, yeah. But man, any I feel like it's just from my talking to people, anybody that's into motorcycles is stoked to go see it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, I it's mean, gonna be, it's gonna be monumental, dude. I think it's gonna be. I think it's gonna be just. I mean, I, I like I said, I, I plan on you know dragging my son to go watch it the first you know weekend it comes out. Try to get those box box office numbers up. So yeah. you know what I mean. It's like that. It's it's like everything, right? I mean, all these when motorcycle things are being made, motorcycles seem to support it. Yeah. Because if you don't, then the the things don't happen, right? So. The movie's gonna be good. It's got great actors. It's got a great storyline. You can pick up the book, the Danny Lyon book on fucking Amazon. Dude, I think everywhere. that already, yeah, the book sales have gone up. Oh, it has to be just because the buzz about the movie. People are like, "What this book?" Because a lot of people don't know about the book. Yeah, but I mean, you know, we know about the book. You know, but uh, but it's like a like for people out there, like the book is it's it's kind of a photo book with interviews in it. So yeah. it's not like a. The, the storyline is novel. loose. Yeah, it's not a novel. Exactly. 
And so you got to, you know, you have to read it and put yourself in the time frame. And, you know, there's a lot of things outside of context that you don't really know about that you just kind of got to go along for the ride. But for the most part, like I looked into trying to find like a first edition book, which right now you can still get them fairly cheap. Yeah. Uh, less than a grand for that, if that's cheap. Um, but I thought it'd be cool to get like a first edition from, you know, 60s yeah. and whatnot. So, man, fucking, uh, I mean, those are the, that's the, the most famous motorcycle photos mm -hmm. that exist other than like old, like scene photos from Easy Riders, mm -hmm. you know, the, you know, cause you can yeah. buy the behind the scene shots from Easy Riders, you know, yeah. there's some really cool ones that, that are, that you can buy prints of or whatever from the, and, uh, if I remember correctly, Dennis Hopper took a bunch of photos on that movie set, and those photos are really cool. Oh, I didn't know that. Um, but, I mean, the bike riders, people, I talk to people like, hey, this movie's coming out. It's going to be really cool. We're working on it. You know, I'm putting my bikes in this movie, and all, everybody's like, oh, and I'm like, it's based on this book, and they never heard of the book. Mm -hmm. And then I pull up that one photo mm -hmm. and show them that photo, and they're like, oh, I know that photo. Yeah, yeah. Like, everybody knows that fucking photo of him riding on the bridge, you know? Mm -hmm. And there's a scene in the movie where they copy that riding over the bridge. Nice. Um, but for artistic licensing, like Austin's looking at the camera instead mm -hmm. of looking this way. You know yeah. what I mean? Just because it's like, he's looking this way. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. But the other, the other spoiler I'll fucking throw out there is that um, Milburn built a replica of that bridge bike. Okay. The no, you know, the chrome fender, uh -huh. tan tank, pan head with the tank shift but the scene on the bridge is Austin Butler's character and Austin Butler already had this established bike for his character so he's not on the oh, okay. bike that was built to look like the bridge bike mm. but they did film the movie in Cincinnati where that bridge is because mm -hmm. um, that bridge is like a bridge that goes from Ohio to Kentucky yeah I've ridden across it before yeah, yeah. we rode across it like a ton of times. Those bridge, all those bridges, even if you're like over there going into what is it, a Louisville? Or I something? mean, there's like 20 bridges yeah, like yeah, on yeah. that river, and it's like which one's the right one? So they're like getting on the bridge with the photos and like looking at the rivets on the handrails, like not this one, <laughs> not this. But the bridge has been altered in the last 20 yeah. something years, so you have to find what's new added yeah. or whatever. Yeah. But uh, pretty cool. Yeah. For pretty sure. cool. The whole fucking thing is pretty fucking cool. I'm. I need to meet Jeff, man. Uh, Matt used to, you used to work, not with him, but around him a lot. So my buddy Matt Reeder, he actually knows you too. Uh, that name I, sounds familiar. Killer. Oh yeah. Short little buddy. Yeah, he used to work guy. for Milburn. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I used to work with him. Killer. So. He. This kid's name is Killer. <laughs> yeah. Have you met him? No. No. He's you know, how, you know when somebody gets a nickname like Slim yeah. and they're like four hundred pounds. Yeah. That's what Killer is. Killer, when Killer first started working for Miller, he's like right out of high school and he's yeah. like a 98 pound little skinny kid. Yeah. And he's like, Killer. <laughs> so. What's funny is, you know, we, we're both Matt's and we're actually like a day apart. So we used to tell everybody that we were brothers. Uh -huh. We worked right next to each other. Twins. Yeah. And, the, and yeah, there's jokes about that. But he, uh, yeah, he used to work with Jeff. So we used to go to his shop on occasion. And He's um, a hell of a body man, too. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, that's that's actually why we went over there because he was doing some body work that Jeff couldn't get to because he was too busy with yeah. something else because yeah. you know all the projects he's done. Well, body work takes so much time. Yeah, I know my fingers right Nobody now. Nobody likes to get people to help with that shit. Yeah, yeah. You know? I usually do too, but I decided to do the body work on this myself, you know, this frame, it. and do my fingers like they're they're still raw from the last two nights of finger fucking you know all these little spots oh, and whatnot God. no but i do i want to meet jeff like i i've known of him for years back when i used to work with gary he used to bring parts over to gary's shop to get painted a lot oh, yeah yeah so well man if you ever uh i'll lean on you for if, that if you ever find yourself wanting to go to lunch in dallas just hit me up we yeah. ride the motor we'd ride the lunch almost you know uh, every day sure. we can so i used to work at park place and every time I went to the morning, like at least once a week, I'd see him ride his bike yeah. right yeah. there off of uh, Industrial. Yeah. Back when he used to work, because I don't know if he still has that shop. His, shop, Central, his right? shop is right off Inwood. Yeah, because that's that's yeah. where it was. Because I thought I heard he, he got a new shop, too. But he I just bought a remember. building across the street. But he's still, yeah. and then he bought a building in Greenville. Mm. But uh, yeah, he's still there over right off uh, Inwood and Thirty Five. Yeah, I thought it was Empire Central though for some reason, but it's Inwood. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, man. Like that whole the whole movie, man. I'm I'm super excited about it, and I'm 
like I said, you know, kind of beat a dead horse with it now, but it's just, it's really nice to have something of this caliber coming that's a representation of what this world of motorcycling is, or just like a, the past of it, if yeah. you will. So um, hopefully that brings, you know, just more light to motorcycles over the next couple of years. And, you know, like I said, you've got your easy riders for the 70s, then you got your, you know, Harley Davidson and the Marble Men for the late 80s, and, you know, your Stone Cold in the 90s, and, we just haven't had a good motorcycle, you know, related movie that could kind of, you know, just fucking exist. I mean, there's, I mean, obviously, obviously the Loveless, you know, it's a great old motorcycle movie that's, you know, there's like 10 characters all on panheads and shit. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you've ever seen that movie. I haven't seen but it. But Willem Dafoe when he was really young. Oh, I th- I've heard of that one, but I haven't seen it. it's fucking Great movie, man. It's like Milburn's favorite movie, but it's it's the look of Dan, okay. the, of the bike riders, book, okay. right? So, a bunch of greasers on on old bikes, you know, pre chopper era. Mm. Um, it's just such a beautiful movie. Not other than Willem Dafoe, there's not a lot of great acting in it, and the storyline is kind of like whatever. But it just looks so good, you know. It's a great fucking movie. Milburn rented out the Alamo Draft House a few months ago and showed it. Nice. And we went to a party there. It was fucking cool. But it looks cool great hell. on the big screen. Um, Are y'all doing anything big for this release? Or yeah, what? we're planning the Dallas uh, premiere deal. You know, there will be some sort of premiere party and try to put the word out. Everybody ride their bikes. Oh, yeah. Let me know. I'm and, definitely down for that. Yeah. I should have the FXR done by then. Hey, well, <laughs> you got to have it done by then, <laughs> dude. You're going on the FXR tour, dude. Yeah. But it's a FXR. It'll break down. So. I'll put a twin cam in it, so it should hey. be good. Hey. Uh, Man, but no. um, well, we got to talk about Born Free a little bit. Well, let's talk about the bike riders, uh, the tour. The oh yeah. Do. So well, what's the, what's the whole premise behind? So this? bike riders tour, obviously. Uh, I've been f- a huge fan of the Span Lucero for uh-huh. I don't know forever. I can tell the quick version of the story. Like I, I was tattooing a Little Rock. And I like this band called Mulehead. And they're like, oh, man, this guy, he started the band. It's like there's this band Lucero, blah, 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 blah. If you like Mulehead, you'll like it or whatever. And it, when it was first told to me, I was under, I thought it was John Lucero, the pro skateboarder that started the band. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, man, I got to check it out. And so, like, shortly after that, me and my buddy were on a road trip, and we stopped at, like, a CD store at a sound warehouse. Mm-hmm. Or those, yeah. either it was either sound warehouse or uh, I can't remember the name of the other fucking big music chain store back then. Um, but we were going to buy some CDs for the road trip. Yeah. You know, this is all pre-cell phone type shit. And, uh, or pre, you yeah. know, MP3, MP3 players yeah. or whatever. So we go in there, and I'm we looking and buying some CDs, and I, I remember, I said, oh, yeah, I want to see if – See if they have that John Lucero band. Remember how that was back in the day? Like you couldn't just like, oh, let me hear this real quick on yeah. Spotify or some shit. So I go in the music. St- I go. I'm, I'm like, hey, y'all have John Lucero? And they're like, I never heard of that. Let me look. And then they go through, and sure enough, there's this fucking one CD in the fucking deal, Lucero. Turns out it's not John Lucero. Yeah, it's yeah. just a band named Lucero, and it's this this guy Ben Nichols from Little Rock, Arkansas. But anyway, they had a deal where you could like. You could listen to the they oh, yeah, yeah. headphones I the, on and listen to it. On, yeah. And uh, I fucking put the CD in and push play. And the first track on the first album, it's like got this real cool like da na da na da na da na na da 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 But it's like kind of like a countryish twangy version of like Thin Lizzy intro, right? Uh-huh. And it just sounds so cool. And instantly, I like look at my buddy Mike, and I'm like. It's my new favorite band. I've listened to it for like 15 seconds. And I'm like, so then we buy it and get in the car and we jam it or whatever. And then it's just like my favorite band for the next however many years. And, we're, you know, every time the new album comes out. And then, man, the story is longer. I said it was going to be quick. But then I go on Warp Tour. (laughs) Yeah. And I'm on Warp Tour. And me and my buddy that's the tour manager of these other bands, we're hanging out every night. And uh, we're listening to Lucero. We like have this PA system on the tour bus that we set up at night, mm-hmm. play cornhole and just jam music. We're just cranking Lucero, and people are like, what is this? And it's like, you know, and we're just like stoked on it. And uh, then one summer, after tour's over, a buddy Jimmy calls me. Mm. He's like, bro, 
guess what job I just got? And I was like, what's that? He's a tour managing Lucero. And I was like, we're in. Yeah. And he's like, we're in. I'm like, I'm in. I'm going on tour, right? So I'm like, I like, I signed myself up. I'm going on tour with Lucero. Yeah. Here we go. Cause my buddy's the tour manager now. And I just like, I just bogarted my way in, put, <laughs> stuck my foot in the door and wouldn't let it shut, you know? And I'm like, <laughs> so then I start meet them, hang out with them, start tattooing them, and just like for years, like yeah. going on tour with them. And then, you know, Ben had a song that he wrote based on the book yeah. called Bike Riders. It's a great fucking song. And then Ben was like going to go and ride his motorcycle mm. to go play a couple of shows and just put his guitar on the back of his bike and just go do some solo shows and do, do a couple of solo shows and go play. Does he sing? Or is yeah. He, okay. he plays guitar and sings. Okay. And so I hear about this, and I'm like, ho, 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 hold on a minute. You're going to ride your motorcycle on and do a tour and play song, play music? I'm going. Yeah. And he's just like, well, I kind of just go by myself. I'm like, no, no. You can't go by yourself. Uh -huh. I'm going to go with you. So I I make this plan. I'm like, what day? And I, so... Again, I just fucking put my foot in the door and like take no for an, wouldn't take no for an answer. And next thing you know, I'm like, what are we gonna call the tour? He's like, what do you mean? I'm like, gotta name it something. And then we're like, of course, bike riders tour. Yeah. And so then I book tattoos, put all my tattoo, a bit of big, I get the biggest tour pack they make. Uh huh. And I fucking make my whole tattoo gear fit in that tour pack. And then I book tattoos in every city, and then we just ride and I go to town, do tats, go to the club play a show go to town go to the next town nice and then it just fucking you've been doing this for quite a few years so i remember you talked about I it i mean before. i think the first year was 12 2012 okay. and we did it every year you do the tour bike riders tour 2020 or 2013 2014 2015 you know and it mm. would like oh, what is this one i'm wearing a hat this one says 2019 great lakes run Mm. So we started, we did Chicago, Milwaukee, we did okay. that whole area, Cleveland, you know, whole area up there. And then one year we went to the East Coast, one year we went to the West Coast, one year we did like New Orleans and Alabama and Georgia. Okay. And so every year it's like a different, usually it's about two weeks, 10 or 15 shows over the course of a couple of weeks. And it's all cities pretty close where it's like, you know, a couple hundred miles, like yeah, yeah. a five hour ride to each city. That way you can wake up in the morning jam the next city, get there by 2 o'clock, do some taps, get to the club by 6 o'clock, okay. play the show. But basically, we just get up in the morning, ride to the city, go to the shop, I do a couple taps, go to the club, he plays the show, we party all night, wake up and ride to the next city next morning. Sounds like just, a blast. It's the greatest thing on earth, man. It's the, I mean, it's just been, it's like a vacation and a party, and I get to hear Ben Nichols play music every night, and I get to do taps every day, and, you know, it's just kind of like, so the last like handful of years, it's just like Ben Nichols and Oliver Peck bike riders tour, and I like host the show and get up and announce, and we do a charity raffle every night. Yeah. And this year, Simpson Helmets, mm -hmm. best motorcycle helmet in the world, That's right. uh, sponsored us, and we gave away a, a helmet every night of the tour. Nice. We sell raffle tickets, and during the middle of the show, we pick the winner. And then White Knuckler brand gave us a knife to give away every night of the tour. So we were giving away helmets and knives every night. And uh, I mean, the Simpson deal is killer. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they really are the best helmets. Um, and the way they do it is they just give us a voucher. Yep. And it's good for any motorcycle helmet on the website. Mm -hmm. So any, any helmet you want, you know, you can get the fucking $700 carbon fiber helmet. You can get the fucking modular yeah. helmet. You can get the, you know, but... I feel like most people go for the most expensive one when they just get it. Yeah, for when free. they win some. Yeah. yeah. It's like, but, uh, what's the most expensive thing on this list? Exactly. I mean, why yeah. wouldn't you? But, yeah. uh, no, it's great. And, you know, it's like there was a couple of nights where, um, we draw the winner for the knife and the winner for the helmet. And the guy that won the helmet didn't ride motorcycles, but the guy that won the knife did. And they were like, man. You want the knife? You want the helmet? And they would switch. Yeah, yeah. And it was it just worked out. But every night, whoever got the helmet was somebody who wanted it or needed it. Or yeah. like, a, you know, a, a mom won the helmet one night and her son rides motorcycles and it was his birthday and it was just fucking, you know, yeah. real cool kind of shit. But uh, really, st I mean, it fucking worked out so great. So how many of y'all go on the tour? Is it kind of like just a handful of you guys? Yeah. Well, this year I got... 
uh, Lulu and the Black Sheep. Mm-hmm. Al, you know Al? I don't know him, but Al I know. Al and Lulu, yeah. they went on the tour, and Al rides, so he rode. And they do they play music, and they too? Open, they, they open yeah. the show every night. They play the opening band every night. Mm. And uh, Lulu drove the merch vehicle. Like, she drove a minivan with all the merch and gear in it. Mm-hmm. So that way we have, like, you know, we have a whole merch set up every night. The first couple of years, we were, like, just, just packing duffel bag and yeah. loading merch and then having merch drop shipped to every couple of cities, which works, but having a merch vehicle is way better. Yeah. And with her going on the tour, it just worked out great. But this year, Audra, my girlfriend, she rode. Mm-hmm. Um, our good friend Kayla that also works with us with Cheat Thrills and Ladies of Cheat Thrills, she mm-hmm. rode with us, and they worked the merch booth every night. And um, our buddy Leland from Shit Luck, he mm-hmm. goes on the tour almost every year because he's also, like, a huge Lucero fan, and he rides. Yeah. And then Joe Brown, the sound, Ben Sound Guy, rides. That's cool. It's like your whole the whole crew to put on this event is all on motorcycles. It's just all on motorcycles. Yeah. yeah. So we show that's, up. Doing it like that's probably the best way too, because you have like this personal connection. Where Nobody does it. Yeah. No other no no other band or or singer or you know musician is just like loading up with a bunch of group on a motorcycle and riding town to town. Yeah. And we fucking rode, dude. We did like fucking forty eight hundred miles on this fucking mm-hmm. trip. Well, for me, first show was in in Columbus. So you had to ride. So we had to leave it. Dallas and ride to Columbus just to mm-hmm. start the fucking. Hell, that's I'm a, a thousand, thousand miles yeah. in show day one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, man, this year we got so lucky, dude. We fucking didn't even get hot. Oh, Leaving Dallas, weird. Dallas to Columbus. How are you gonna leave Dallas? In so fucking, you you just got done with this tour like within the last week, right? It was week the last day was the September second. Okay, well, shit. Yeah. You were in the heat when you left, though, we huh? We get not hot. It Bro. wasn't hot. We just got lucky. Like, there was, it was overcast, and, I mean, we probably only got maybe 45 minutes of rain the whole fucking two weeks, mm-hmm. but we were close to rain yeah, a lot. Yeah. Like, there was four overcast, and it, we were riding where it had previously rained. It was about to rain, but it just... Never dumped on you. We didn't yeah. get hot until Atlanta. Hot Atlanta, baby. And we got hot. Atlanta to Florida was hot as fuck. And then yeah. it that's when it like started to rain a little bit and it cooled it off. And uh we dodged a hurricane in Florida. We were literally in um Yeah, I went to Tampa because I saw his post. We skipped Tampa because the that, hurricane the hurricane, hurricane yeah. canceled Tampa. But we were supposed to we were in Fort Walton Beach and we were supposed to ride from Fort Walton Beach to Orlando the next day. And that was the day the hurricane was sweeping across, going okay. from Tampa to Orlando. So we had to like mis- we had to reroute and not go to Orlando. Or okay. Tampa. Um, That's the further south y'all were going, though, huh? Yeah. Okay. And then we the, it ended in Birmingham. We came back up to Birmingham and ended in Birmingham. I've never actually like kicked it in Birmingham, but I've ridden through it a hundred times. Is it Fucking pretty good cool, town, dude? Fucking cool town. Yeah. Yeah. It's Very like, industrial feeling yeah, coming in, it, tucked it in the side of the It has that hills. like Milwaukee feel a little yeah. bit, you know, um, Pittsburgh, Milwaukee kind yeah. of feel. Um, but man, it's fucking built up. A lot of cool places, of, you know. A lot of the old industrial buildings are now like venues and oh, okay. and cool. living spaces, and you know, a lot gentrified. of gentrified. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but it's different super type. Cool. Yeah, the venue there is like the best venue of the whole tour. It's called the Saturn, mm. and it was like really cool venue with, and a great show, great people, a um, lot of good places to eat there. Mm. Um, and it's beautiful riding through Alabama. It's beautiful area. Yeah, it's actually it's a lot really like nice. Tennessee, a lot like Virginia kind of feel. Usually, when we go to like the Smokies or Chattanooga, we'll cut through Birmingham, and then that route from Birmingham north to Chattanooga is it's one of my favorite. It's nice. It's nothing there. Nice, clean, you know, highway with trees and some hills, and the closer you get, to a lot Tennessee. of areas where you have that like that smoky feel where you're yeah. like. Up high and can see the big yeah, valleys yeah. down below. Yep. Kind of reminds me of like being through, going across in Virginia, crossing, mm-hmm. you know, northern Tennessee area. I, I want to get off the main highway and more of that part of the country, which I have not done yet. I've only, you know, I've been on like a, a mission in New York. So it's yep. like yep. blasting, you know, to one of the major highways and maybe a, a smaller highway, but getting off the highway, period, just going on the I'm back trying to roads. I remember exactly where I was, but kind of like West Virginia. Up through 
no, going north up through Ohio. From, no, from yeah, going more northeast, going up through Virginia, oh, going up to like a few hundred miles on little two laners off the main highway. Unbelievable. Yeah, unbelievable. I've only ridden through the Panhandle of West Virginia. A, it adds a lot of time. Yeah, because you're you know if you're going. You're heading northeast, but you're really going south and then west and then east because yeah, yeah. you're just doing this nonstop forever. You're like, man, it's that's like why it ten added- miles as the crow flies. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, a hundred miles, <laughs> but so great. If you're not in a hurry, it's the way to go. Yeah. So yeah, uh, we're coming down to the wire, man. Uh, we got four weeks ish till Born Free Texas. Yeah, man. Uh, I think it's gonna be fucking great. We've got a lot of cool shit lined up. Audra's fucking book, like 15 or 20 fucking bands. We're going to have music. Uh, Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday. Um, And the the real big push this year that is encouraged as opposed to last year is that people can come earlier. Mm. You know, last year they started out with like, oh, man, people can't get in until Saturday. Technically. And vendors can get in and set up on Friday. But then I was like, wait a minute. People are going to be supposed to come. Yeah, from far away, and then like not come in, so they kind of loosened up on that and let people camp Friday. But now it's like, fucking come on Thursday and camp. Yeah. And so I think I'm predicting Thursday night to be the best night. <laughs> yeah, because everybody. Weekend. Yeah, because everybody's Cause gonna the be people that show up early. It won't be the melee yet. It'll be like chill, and we're gonna have some, have a little pre-party on site so you can mm-hmm. camp and be ready and it's just that's, you don't have to leave anywhere you can just stumble yeah, back to you yeah we got lots of food vendors lined up we've got the bar rocking we've got multiple stages going we've got uh have this little store on site so people can buy all the little little yeah, necessities you need. you need and um really you just don't want if people are going to party too much you don't want people have to get on their bike and ride and go get shit they need, you know what mm-hmm. I mean? So it's, it's kind of like making it that kind of event where it's like you can just chill here, yeah. you know, yeah. and just get in here and um, be a lot of different stuff to do. Um, I think we're probably going to have a real big turnout for the chopper drags. Mm-hmm. Well, dirt, we call it dirt drags because it's not just choppers. We're going to have yeah. classes for every fucking thing. Anything you want to fucking run down that dirt track, anything Brilliant. you're willing to fucking... <laughs> lay on there is, is good for me yeah fucking mini bikes baggers fucking whatever yeah um but last year that was a that was a highlight yeah you know just the dirt drags you know everybody down we got a little more dialed in um i'm actually getting out there monday we're getting some big dirt equipment out there and gonna fix you know tune everything up and make it a little better and i'm gonna run i'm gonna smooth out the run out of mm. that drag strip so it, it's not so, like a hurry up and get off of it. It's a home. little safer. Yeah, yeah. Not too much safer. I don't want to make it too safe because then it'll just be weak. But yeah. just make it smoother to where people, I mean, you you see that? Yeah, yeah, people yeah. at the end, like, if you go too long, yeah. then you're in the, you run out past the run out. And then it's just like, wow. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so that'll be cool. Um, and so the main bar set up, like y'all have a whole outdoor area for that now too, like connected yeah, to that. To got where... a couple different outdoor setups and then the indoor bar there is fully functional now. We've mm-hmm. got a lot more, we've just been constantly doing work mm-hmm. to the place since last year. Like yeah. fix it. Cause you know, when we got the place, it had just been sitting. And so it's like, we're just, we've got a mile long list of things that need to be fixed and we're just chipping away at it, chipping yeah. away at it, chipping away at it. Um, I mean, my partner, Sean Hodges is like, he is like Mr. Goddamn handy. Like yeah. if you need if I mean, he can do some shit woodworking or fucking fixing shit or fucking. And then the guys that live on the property, Tony and Carrie, they're killing it. Mm-hmm. And it's just like a lot of things. There's been a lot of improvements mm-hmm. every, every week for a whole year, you know, and there's still a lot more to do. Yeah. It's an endless, you know, it's a five year plan kind of thing. But yeah, yeah. It's it's better and better and better and better. So, pretty cool. But Sean has just been humping his ass, fixing shit, and uh, I'm pretty much going to be out. The Audrey's out there now. I'm going out there in, either tonight or in the morning, and we've got uh, 
just from now till born free, it's pretty much I'm just going to be there working just on get the place it and in, yeah. doing things and as, do as much as we can do, get it ready. Um, but, you know, it could be ready at any minute. Yeah, yeah. There's some things that you're never going to get every single thing done. So we're going to get as much done as you can, you know, but it's, uh, I think it's going to be fucking killer. I think. Yeah, that, I, I had a blast last year, even though I spent a lot of the time in the tent sick. Um, Everybody that was there that actually got into the property and didn't have the issues, you know, getting yeah. in, like everybody had a great time. I think a lot of the locals are the more people that are maybe on, I hate to say it like this, like maybe they're not really a part of our world of motorcycling in the same vein as we are. You know, maybe they're just the, 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 the typical, you know, rot rally goer, right? Yeah. They're the ones that probably saw there's a motorcycle event. Let's just go jam out Check there. And the next thing you know, the lines are out the ass, right? And yeah. Stuff like that. But, you know, the solve of that is, of course, buy the tickets through yeah. YellowRoseCanyon.com, well, we, things like that, you know. You know, last year, it just kind of just, it was just a perfect storm of a lot, too many people showing up right at the same time, mm. you know, which is, you don't know, you don't know how many people are going to show up. Yeah. When you put on an event first year, you don't know anything. You're just winging it. We'll see what happens. We're planning, working yeah. for the best, but then we just everybody just got caught with their fucking pants down, you know. Yeah. And it, this year, we've cleaned up a lot of things. We've got multiple entries into the park. We've got streamlined access. Even if you're buying your ticket, it won't be as long. But obviously, the way to go, mm -hmm. and what we're telling people now, and pushing it, pushing it, pushing it, is just um, buy your ticket mm -hmm. online. And you have until the 5th. I'm going to double check, make sure I'm telling this right. Um, yeah, October 5th. Mm -hmm. So you still got, got time. a week and a half, two weeks. Yeah. But uh, if, you get the, if you buy the ticket online before October 5th, you get the wristband in the fucking mail. You put the wristband on, and you just roll right in the gate. Mm -hmm. There's nothing else. There's no other check or anything. Yeah. Like if you're wearing that wristband, you roll right in. If you got to pick up your wristband there, or if you got to buy a ticket there, you're going to have to get in some sort of line to, to buy it and mm -hmm. retrieve it and blah, 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 blah. But, and, uh, you know, we were, the first tickets that were released were like the full access all weekend pass. Mm -hmm. um, and everybody's like, oh my God, blah, blah, blah. You know, everybody's always going to complain about something, but it's like at the price or whatever. I'm like, hey, this is, your, this is like, we're talking four days full access. Mm -hmm. Come and go as you please it's going to be a little bit more expensive. Mm -hmm. But now there's like the weekend pass available, the day pass available. You know, if you're just going to go for a day, you're just going to go for two days, whatever, you can buy the ticket. But if you don't buy it ahead of time, you got nobody to blame except yourself when you win, yeah. you know. Um, but I know most people just wait until the last minute. Yeah, yeah. And I'm, I'm very guilty of just like, eh, I'll just go day of, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? And, yeah, and, and that's completely fine. I mean, obviously, but, you know, just same thing. If you go do the same thing at Born Free in California, yeah. day of, and you don't have... Oh, the fucking parking line is forever long in Born Free, California. If yeah. you park in a car, Jesus. Yeah. Um, but that's the other thing. If you're going to show up the day of, the earlier the better. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah. people were showing up last year, like, everybody waited till one o'clock to show yeah. up and it was just like yep yep just yep. gridlocked yeah it sucks. and it's that two linen road getting in yeah getting yeah. off the main highway there yeah. and then coming in you know but i i'm stoked for him i think it's gonna be a good good time um i saw uh chemical randy's got a little ride going to uh yeah man it's gonna be the, great the, the the shed what was that thing called the cosmic, cosmic shed. shed yeah yeah and i think I'm not sure how he's doing that exactly. Uh, I just talked to him yesterday. Um, but uh, if anybody's coming and bringing a motorcycle, I highly recommend trying to get in on that ride. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's going to be, I'm pretty sure that's Saturday morning. Yeah. And uh, I'm sure there's going to be quite a few people that are that don't get up in time to go on that ride. But A, in the morning out there through those trees, it's a beautiful ride. Mm -hmm. And if you've never seen the Cosmic Shed, man, it's a very, very special thing to get to check yeah. out. Yeah. Um, so that's, I mean, you know, Randy, you did a, you know, a Cosmic Shed run, camp yeah, out yeah. there for many, many years. And 
it just kind of got the place can only handle so much yeah, yeah. and it's not a place where so many people can go so it kind of got it tamed down but this is a great ride and to give a chance to people to see that place mm-hmm. um but all you need to know is to co- is just get on that ride and go to it yeah and that's the other thing is like you know because i've heard people like mention like that there's not any like planned rides but i don't really know of any other event that there is planned rides at i think it's Mostly like, hey, this well, is Well, last event. year we had a ride. Y'all did? Yeah. Um, and it was great. I just, I think I'm thinking of it more of I like, don't think it was as massively publicized. It was just kind of like. Yeah, but do you want to go on a ride with 100 fucking bikes? I don't want to do that. I think that, um, yeah, I think it would be cool for a couple of different planned rides to happen or whatever. And Randy's yeah. putting one together. So that's fucking killer. Um, and there's good riding out there, you know. There's like there's there. areas that, that can that are there to be explored. I mean, it's it's different land, yeah. like like Texas land. That like like you said, you catch those right times. It's fucking beautiful going through those hills. Yeah. You know what I mean? I mean, there's you can ride a hundred miles and just be on the curvy two lanes mm-hmm. for for if you you know. And these small towns around. have these small restaurants and bars where you yeah. can make these day trips and then come back and rage all night <laughs> yeah it's really cool man it's a it's a perfect spot yeah. for for what we got going on out there it's a perfect spot for a camp out motorcycle gathering and a lot of good riding in and out and not a lot of what other than the people the traffic loading in there's really no traffic out there at all yeah it's... like once you leave the place and get on the road there's really no mm-hmm. um max so i'm going out there be out there tomorrow and uh for those in the area yeah. Nacogdoches area this Saturday at the uh, Lumberjack Harley Davidson. Mm. Me and a couple of guys from Elm Street Tattoo, David Steed, Carlos Gonzalez, and Al Nichols, we will be tattooing this Saturday at the Lumberjack Harley Davidson. They're having a big event. They got a you know, whole big bike day going on, food, music, and blah, blah, blah. And uh, so we're tattooing out there. We got tattoo specials um, starting at 11 a.m., Nice. And the raffle, give them away some free tattoo. And uh, so that'd be fucking cool. And they, you know, they're the local dealership that's going to be a part of Born Free, too. So, yeah, it's uh, their it's their territory, right? Yeah. yeah. And uh, so that's pretty cool that they're, I mean, they're really active in putting on cool stuff. And, you know, every, most of the events we've had out there that they've come out and supported nice. or supported even if they didn't come out, great people over there at at lumberjack Mm. um you know i've got a lot of friends that work at harley dealerships you know in different areas and they're all like man i wish we could do it but they're really restricted on what you can only do events in your area or whatever but it's like that's good because then it gives these people a chance to do yeah the things but they've been super fucking cool man um they've got a nice dealership and yeah, because otherwise you'd have like every big dealership that can afford to swing the extra capital yeah. to promote every event. It would kind of become a monopoly, monopoly in the dealership structures. But we've done a couple. We did an event, uh, what, about a month ago at Dallas Harley Davidson, or maybe a little more than a month ago, where we tattooed there. Yeah. And it was fucking cool. You know? My little brother works there now. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah he's over there. Oh, Jesse. Really? Bikes. Selling bikes. Hell yeah. yeah. And then we did, we were at After Born Free, the weekend after Born Free California, we went to San Diego Harley and did mm, a big event. I remember that, yeah. Day and we tattooed there. Um, so the, the Harley dealerships are kind of jumping on that train of doing cooler shit instead of just your typical fucking yeah. hog, ra- hog rider just show up and yeah, yeah. And, and have free hot dogs. You know, there, a lot of them are doing way cooler shit. I think I saw something about y'all were doing something with Maverick and giving away Born Free tickets. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, Maverick Harley-Davidson. Uh, Audra, you know, puts on that coyote call. Yeah. Uh, with uh, Stephanie, Stephanie that works at Maverick. And so they're doing – we went out to their veterans ride, what, a couple of weeks ago, mm. or we, whenever that was. Um, and that was pretty cool. Um, and they're doing some promotion where they're giving away Harley tickets, uh, giving away Born Free tickets. Mm-hmm. Uh, Got a lot of good support from the motorcycle community, you know, um, and all the people that are, you know, everybody's co-promoting really well. Well, that's that's the that's point, the, though. That's, that's what the, you needed to happen. So. Say, I mean, I was out of town and didn't get to go to burnouts 
Yeah. But it looked great. It did look great. And I had a bunch of people that went, and I sent some people out there, and we had the same thing. We, they were, added some born free passes to the raffle mm. and that was pretty fucking cool and uh but you know i think that's the way it should be like all the events should co-promote and all the events should you know help each other and yeah i mean 100 percent that because what you're trying to do is you're trying to build a community of of opportunity for people that ride motorcycles to have something to do and the more that everybody works together and supports each other's stuff then the, the bigger that community grows and the more like the, the more fruit this tree bears for everybody yeah. to have, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, you know, it, it makes sense to, for every, everybody to come together to try to make this good. And plus the fact that like we're prideful here in Texas. So it's like, and this, if we're doing an event, we want people that are coming here from other States to come here and be like, Texas is fucking the shit. You know what I mean? Well, Right now we're in a fucking pretty sweet spot, man. We've got really good events in really cool spots spaced out throughout the year mm -hmm. um, that you are going to, everybody can make at least one or two of them. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? When you got Fandango, it's really turned into something special, mm -hmm. you know, and the fact that, you know, the AMCA guys have really pushed mm -hmm. to, to allow that camping and, yeah. and, and bring that element to it instead of it just being a come and go type thing. Yeah. Um, Cause you know, a lot of events don't have the ability for people to stay a yeah. lot of events don't have the ability for that but i think that makes a big difference it, it opens you know? the door for more opportunity and yeah. a different experience as well dude this year fandango was great mm. the camp out was huge and it was just a one it was like a big family reunion camp out party barbecue concert i mean mm -hmm. it's just fucking amazing yeah you know and this year we had a really good uh really good turnout for Southern Throwdown. Mm -hmm. um, and it was the same weekend as the Hill Cunt, as the Texas, Hills. Texas Hills show, which kind of, yeah, kind of delete, you know, some people went there, some people went there. It's kind of splits it up because they're not that, they're not that close. It's not like a hundred miles apart or anything, yeah, yeah. but it's still, people are going to go to one or the other. Um, it was like, if you're in Dallas, you're either going 200 miles there or 150 miles there. Yeah. So, but it was, uh, man, we had a great turnout, and it, we were kind of like on the downside of Southern Throwdown, and now it's kind of on the ramp up. Mm. And uh, just the fact that you know the the campout aspect and and the, and the and the stages and the music and the you know the vibe, I think it's we're planning on kicking kicking it up for Southern Throwdown next year. Nice. Um, but it's kind of like not a whole lot different from what's going on at Born Free, just a little bit smaller scale. Mm. But uh, this has got to be difficult, too, to try to create a different experience for these yep. different shows. Yeah. Because, I mean, in hindsight, some of the, the premise is still the same, but how do you turn, you know, like Southern, like early Southern Throwdown was at the Bomb Factory, or even before that, wasn't it just kind of out in the parking yeah. lots and stuff? So, like, creating these different vibes for these places is definitely going to be the harder part that way it's not the same event everywhere you go you know? well i like it a lot better now yeah even though we had you know we used to get a, a large amount of people when it was at the bomb factory but most of those people were not on motorcycles yeah it was just something to do on a sunday yeah so now it's like a camp out <coughs> and you know less people but a much better mm -hmm. much better experience i think um from my point of view yeah have you seen what uh nitty gritty's doing I heard they can't. They're coming back, so I don't know what they're doing though. Well, found the new venue. It's another big, large campground. Okay. Uh, and it's looking pretty fucking sweet. And they do that like early November, right? I or is it October? Pretty sure it's in the fall. Yeah. yeah I need to look that up. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, it's uh, but it's looking. The I've been talking to Eric Vaughn about it. Yeah. And it looks like it's gonna be killer. I I mean we went to. It seemed like every year at Nitty Gritty, someone either lost a finger, <laughs> someone oh went God. swimming with the crocodile, yeah, someone jumped the bonfire. Like there was always some weird shenanigan taking place. So. I mean, it's a. I mean, I. What Nitty Gritty was was like a small little nitty fucking gritty. Yeah. You know, I think the new the new expansion of Nitty Gritty is going to take it to the next level. You know, I think if they get the promotion out there and they get the interest. I think it could be really fucking cool. Yeah. It's going to be the same. It's kind of things that are graduating to the same vibe as 
Born Free, Fandango, Southern, you know, the big weekend experience things. Yeah. You know, and for for the people that like to ride, that's the thing that I think people are going to more gravitate to. Because if you go to Nitty Gritty, most people own that are in Houston, like, ride there, walk around the fucking parking lot for an hour, and then ride out. Yeah. You know what I mean? But that's the bulk of the people that go to the show, you know? But people that go to Fandango ride all the way out there, then spend days riding through the hill country and camp out one or two nights, and it's a whole fucking mm-hmm. experience. Same thing with going to Born Free. You're going to come out to Born Free, whether you – and nothing against people that bring their bikes and trailers because I'm that guy sometimes. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because sometimes I'd – you know, especially if we're setting up a cheap girls booth, you know, people try to give you fucking – people try to talk shit that when I show up on a trailer, you know? And I'm like, I'm here with a mer- booth, tables, tents – yeah. You know, and then I've got bikes, and then while we're here, we ride around while we're here. That's what we do in Fandango. Yeah. You know, I take too much shit, and we're putting on the show at Fandango, so you can't. Yeah. It's... But we go ride through the hill. We spend three days riding around, hanging out, doing the show, and, and then we pack it all up and drive home, you know? It's... Yeah, what's that threshold you got to get to where you've ridden so – you put so many miles on bikes where it's like you're okay to be able to be in a trailer. You know what I mean? Yeah. I well, like, I want to ride for fun. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes, I've always, you know, I've always had a hard like stance on trailers and stuff. But yeah. it's more for the the aspect of like, like I understand the the necessity and the place where trailers are needed in yeah. everybody's motorcycle life. That my bike's been on a trailer before, but yeah. I always try to push, you know, the everyday rider guys to ride to Sturgis for once and try that and see how that feels you know but don't that's the that when you ride I've ridden to Sturgis a few times yeah and when I do it like I don't ride much at all once you get there yeah you know the ride to there and from there is the, the ride, fucking yeah. like last the last we didn't go this year last year we like left Sturgis early uh-huh and like went to Yellowstone and went to Salt Lake and then went all through Moab and all yep. through Arches and all through and went to Bryce Canyon and went all the you know we spent that's the way way to do longer it. Yeah. on the way home than we did on the you know mm-hmm. but uh, you can I feel like not everybody can take two weeks off to go to fucking Sturgis yeah and that's why the trailer it you makes put sense your shit for in a trailer people. you haul ass the fuck out there and then once you're there you can ride fucking spearfish you can ride Mount Rushmore you can ride Badlands you can ride to fucking Devil's Tower you can yeah. spend three days and see all the coolest shit probably put 2,000 miles hour on this way, hour this way hour this way hour this way or two hours this way and then load it all up and be home and only be gone fucking five days yeah fucking great mm-hmm. so if you love riding motorcycles, that's all that really matters. Yeah, I think at, at the end of the day, it's like it, it, basically the way that you're able to enjoy motorcycles is that's you. That's how you're doing it. You know, me, I choose to ride as much as possible. But, you know, there's going to be a point in time in my life where I won't be able to. Yeah. You know, so. Well, dude, on Bike Riders Tour, every year, every fucking year on Bike Riders Tour, every fucking show, every night, there's some dude that's, you know, that you know, I knows who I am, or he shows up on his fucking panhead or shovel head, or, and I'm like on the, this year I'm on the 2021 electric glide with all the shit, yeah. you know, and he's like, oh man, you should be riding your shovel head, and I'm just like, no, yeah, you can't, this, I mean, you can't, you could not, you ride got a obligations shovel. every you night, you could not ride a shovel head on this tour, yeah, there are some days where I have to do fucking balls to the wall to get to the tat shop on time. You know what I mean? And it's like, phew. Yeah, I, I've been saying that for years about reasons why I chose to stay on the bagger for the last five years with this the podcast stuff. It's like when I'm on the road and same thing with your tattoo stuff. It's like I have a podcast at 2 p.m. at that place. Exactly. I need to be there. I got a noon tat appointment. So five hours away. Yeah. I'm 100 miles an hour. 7 a.m. <laughs> you know what I mean? Would not. I would not make it. Yeah. On time. If I was on a panhead or a shovel head, no way, you're not gonna do it. Exactly. So it's like it's it's consolidating. Like you're able to ride a bike and do this thing that you want to do, but you have to pick a bike that is less. Like if I was gonna ride a panhead or a shovel head across country, that would be something I want to want to take as much time as I possibly yeah, can but to you enjoy. Don't know it. where you're gonna be. Yeah. When you leave, when you wake up in the morning, you do not know where town you're staying in. Yeah. 
You don't. Yeah. You're gonna. You could try for this spot, but you might not make it. <laughs> You might not. I mean, unless you're Danger Dan, we, makes it on time. <laughs> we, he does not make it on time. He doesn't. Oh, his shit. shit blows up, and he has to fucking put a new top end on his motor in the middle of a field in fucking Wisconsin. I mean, that shit happens. <laughs> um, but you never know. Yeah. I mean, we went to Lone Star River on one year, mm-hmm. and we like I think maybe six six of us left Alice mm-hmm. on old bikes, and then we. Met a few more people in West mm-hmm. at the at the fucking the check, check stop, right? Yeah. And so then we met a few more people that are on old bikes. So there's eight or so people on bikes to go to New Braunfels. Yeah, it fucking took nine hours. <laughs> I mean, it was pitch black by the time we got to New Braunfels. Yeah, you know, it's three and a half, four hours. Yeah, if you're on a on a on a new bike, but you got people that can only go 60 miles on a tank of gas. Yeah. On their low peanut chopper tanks. And then you got people that every, that their bike is just rattling loose and losing bolts and sissy bars falling off and fucking yeah. shitting out oil all everywhere and fork seals blowing up. And every gas stop is an hour at least. You know what I mean? It's like, it's just like. Check that one thing that was feeling weird. And next thing you know, never, it's a big mess. Never, dude. Yeah, that was long. <laughs> Like, oh, my God. Not, yeah, I think it took nine hours. So, you know, you're kind of like definitely like a, you know, Deep Ellum is part of your DNA, if you will. Like, how do you, like, how do you, where do you see Deep Ellum going in the next couple of years? Like, it seems like it's going through another. I think it's going to keep doing the same thing it's been doing for the last 30 years that I've been down there. It's mm-hmm. just going to fucking go through waves. It's just going to yeah. fucking just, right now it's just. I mean, it's it's the landscape's different now, it, dude. Well, the the pandemic fucking hit it pretty hard. Yeah, and a lot of uh, you know, we had a me and my girlfriend had a restaurant. Me mm-hmm. and Andre had Tiki Tiki Loco down there, and uh, we closed it January, mm-hmm. uh, January twenty twenty two. Oh wait, is that right? I think so. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's been closed for a little while, um, but we should have. We never since the pandemic, it never came back. Yeah, we stayed open too long. Like we kept hoping that it was going to come back. Push it back, yeah. Hoping it was going to come back. So we were hanging on, and it just didn't come back. And I think there's like 15 restaurants that have been out of bi- went out of business uh, in Deep Ellum the last few years, mm-hmm. and now there's just. A See, ton of empty places. Yeah, it it seems like uh like over on so you're on Elm and then Main Street. It seems like a lot of my friends that are, that had spots there, their their rents going up so much that yeah. they they're kind of getting pushed out by like I guess higher. They're trying yeah. to Greenville Avenue the area yeah. or some well, shit. Greenville yeah. Avenue is fucking popping, man. It is. Um, but man, I when I first started going to Deep Ellum in the late 80s when I was in high, you know, went to punk rock shows yeah. when I was a senior, junior, senior high school. I mean, Deep Ellum was like abandoned, basically. Yeah. There was Clearview, and then Orbit Room opened, and then there was like the, you know, uh, Flamingo Joe's Mexican restaurant and Video yeah. Bar and a few places and trees. Yeah. Um, and then there's a bunch of empty buildings, and then there's a bunch of people living in warehouses that were just empty warehouses. Yeah. And then... It kind of fucking went up, and then at one point in the nine in the late nineties, Deep Ellum was at like ninety something percent occupancy. Mm. Like every building was something. Yeah. And then, <sighs> crashed down. Fucking, it went down to about fifty percent occupancy, and then it fucking whoosh, ramped back up, and all these new places came in, and you know, mm. uh. A lot of places have come and gone, and a lot of places have, have come and stayed, but uh, now, like compared to five years ago, if you wanted to rent a spot in Deep Ellum, good luck. Yeah. Now, if you want to rent a spot in Deep Ellum, there's fucking 20 of them on Elm Street. Mm. Like Anvil's for rent. Dude. Yeah, R.I.P. Anvil's I miss fucking. That spot. 
Anvil, Brain Dead, Tiki Loco, Hypnotic Donut, the Donut Place, fucking. Uh, the Donut Place is closed. Oh yeah. Oh shit. Um, right there on that block, there's like five big spaces that are empty. Uh, green Room closed. I don't know, man. It, um, it's just it's it's like it's weird because of like growing up here and just seeing that place always be this. I mean, I've seen a lot of show. I'm probably nowhere near as many as you or our buddy Kyle seen down there, but I've. I've seen a lot of bands, you know, come in those small venues, like where you want to see a band at, right? Yeah. You know, I saw, I got to see Deftones in Trees, Trees you know what I mean? (laughs) I think Trees is still the best room in Dallas. Yeah. I mean, because when you, when a band plays there that's like a sellout, something that's going to sell out Trees, that's a great fucking show. Yeah. Because it's, they're like right on the cusp of move into a bigger venue uh-huh. and once they move to that bigger venue the show loses something yeah you know when a when a band can f- fill out trees that's the best place to see a show yeah um, how many how many people are in in that like what do you think the occupancy is something like a thousand trees? or less mm. yeah it depends Packed if so if they have like a show that's like where a bunch of teenagers are gonna go they the, they sell more tickets mm-hmm. if they have a show where it's like a bunch of Grown adults fucking are gonna go. They sell less tickets because yeah. it's you know takes up more room or people get more rowdy or yeah you know. But they've I've seen some shows in there where you couldn't squeeze another fucking pair of nuts in there, dude. It's fucking <laughs> tight. Um, but it's a great sounding room. It's a cool room. It's fucking yeah. It's like that medium because once you go to House of Blues, yeah. It's a big show, and you may be far away from the action. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But anywhere in trees, you're in it. Yeah, you know, yeah. it's like you're in the. You know, it's like you're right there. It's loud. It's fucking. You're in it. And what's that? What's that one place down there where they put the velvet taco on? There used to be another like you had a Gypsy small room, room and yeah, yeah. you had the big bar, Profit bar and Gypsy yeah. Room. I used, yeah, I saw a lot of people in there back in the day too. Oh yeah, that was the shit. Lots. Of, so man, when that. Probably ninety five ish. The band Ween. Mm-hmm. You heard that band? I've heard of them. Yeah, yeah. They were playing there, and it's like I love that band. And uh, as soon as they booked that show, I'm like, oh, we're fucking going, right? And this guy that was a buddy of mine back then, he's like, hey, make sure that you show up early and see the opening band. The opening band is like this new band that's kicking ass, and that opening band was Queens of Stone Age. And it was the shit. Bro. <laughs> yeah. It was the shit. Um, seen a lot of great shows in that room. Uh, it's just that, I mean, our, you know, our, we got our, our bike night. You've been to it. It's yeah. still going on. We got it at uh, Cold Beer. The Cold Beer Company, which we're on the cusp of the Deep Ellum area. Um, oh, that's yeah. Deep Ellum. You know, it's just, uh, it's just weird, man. Like, it's, I guess especially since I, I don't live in downtown anymore like I used to. I, I'm kind of seeing it in a different vibe. When when I lived downtown, it was like every night I was in Deep Ellum for something, whether I was grabbing, you know, the place that y'all took over, ZZ's Pizza, you see my shit. I used to go there too much, honestly. Um, but now it's just like now I go down and I'm like, oh, shit, it's different here. And then I, a week later I'm here again, and so you see it differently. It's like when you see a kid growing up, you don't see him every day. Dude, so you see fucking- the small increments. So the people that, you know, I, a lot of people come to town that haven't been, mm-hmm. you know, every week somebody comes in and like, oh man, I've been here in a year. And it's like, it's fucking different. I'm like, eh, I'm here every day. I just see the slow comes yeah. and goes and this and that or whatever. But I mean, to me, it's every year it's changed, mm-hmm. you know, every year it's, it just slowly does this or does this or does this, you know, it's like, um, so many places have come and gone. Like I just, if you really look at Deep Ellum right now, there's there's trees, there's Elm Street Tattoo, Dada, and Pepe Amitos. Angry Dog. Angry Dog. There's maybe 10 places yeah. that have been there 20 years. Okay. You know what I mean? Uh-huh. And a lot of those places that have been there 20 years have left in the last couple of years. Clearview, Curtain Club, Gypsy Tea Room, Green Room. Mm-hmm. You know, even Brain Dead was there for a long time. Yeah. 
They were uh, part of that first revamp of yeah, like first re- when they Main first. Street. So that whole area where Brain Dead was, that was empty warehouses until like Lula Bees and Brain Dead went in there. Yeah. Um, and now they've rebuilt a lot of that area again. But I just heard that Easy Slider is closing. Yeah, and then Crowdus on the corner is closed. And cl- and then Point Skate Shop is closed. Point Skate Shop is like what? Next week or something, I think. Yeah, I think something like that. It's something like that. End of this month. I know he's been talking about it for. Yeah, a I went in there the other now. day and bought a couple things just because they're, you know. Yeah, he's so the bowl. Great deals. They're trying yeah. to get rid of the bowl, and I was like, "Where could you put that? Can you, will it fit in your compound?" <laughs> uh, I mean, I could put it somewhere, but everybody's like, "Well, you should take it." And I'm like, "I've built ramps." Yeah. Building a ramp is a motherfucker. Yeah. You know what's worse than building a ramp? Taking it down. Taking it apart. <laughs> now, if you want to take it apart and throw it in the trash, different. You yeah. could take it apart quicker. Yeah. But if you're planning on rebuilding it, it takes twice as long to take it apart. Yeah. And then you got to transport it. But not only do you got to transport it, you got to label everything as to where it goes. Yeah. Like a like a goddamn Lego box. You know. What yeah. I mean? You yeah. got to fucking write on every board where it goes, label it, every fucking this. Um, and I don't know how it was built. If it can come apart in sections or how how much you have to take down. But, I mean, how much is that? Yeah. How long is that going to take? Yeah. Uh, is it worth the money? Is it worth what you're going to spend to buy it on top of it with your time and labor trying to get it so out? That's what I told, I told the one kid. I was like, you give me a price on how much door to door and mm-hmm. maybe I'll buy it. Yeah. You know what I that mean? That makes sense, yeah. Like if you told me you would tear it down... You would load it up. Where would you put it? You though? would move it, and you would put it back together. How much? Yeah. Give me that price, because you could give it to me for free, and I don't want it. Yeah. Because I'm gonna have to spend a week. Yep. With five friends to take a week off, also. Yeah. To fucking kill yourself, break your back, blister every fucking finger you own, and fucking move this motherfucker. And it's yeah. not like all of them are the same, so. They always have something different. And that one's built to fit within that confined space of the shop. I mean, you shops. could put it anywhere. Yeah. You could just put it in a, in a yard, mm-hmm. you know, but you're going to have to buy at least a thousand or more dollars worth of replacement wood, layering, this, that, supplies, whatever. Mm-hmm. Then you're going to have to fucking the labor of moving it. Yeah. It's going to be thousands, you know, if your time is money, it's thousands of dollars. Yeah, for sure. Multiple people. Yeah, a lot of people will help you for an hour. How many people will help you for 80 hours? Yeah, exactly. You want to do it? You in? I mean. I'm good. I, I built this, so it's. Yeah, yeah, we built this together. I know, I'm just saying. It's, it's, it's. I paid them in Corona Premiere. Yay. You know? <laughs> but, uh, no, I just, uh, you know, just know, you know, with uh, Cody working down at Crowdis and that thing closing the, the, the point skate shop. Cody was just telling us that they're having a lot of stuff in Deep Island with like they're trying to bring in different types of businesses and they're kind of making it harder for those other types of businesses to to re up their leases and things like that. And you know, the I guess the maybe what I was alluding to in this whole conversation was like what Deep Ellum has provided for Dallas forever has been like a a way to see music and and be a part of that culture that, you know, wasn't it's kind of like your sixth street. Like every city yeah. has that area where there's good live music. And that's what Lower Greenville is lacking. Yeah. Because it's too, it's too manicured and it's too like we close at this time. There's you go through Greenville Avenue at 11 o'clock at night. It's dead. There's yeah, not there's anything. Like some bars that stay open late, but there's no, there's no trees or three links or any yeah. of that down there. It's all higher end, you know, fancy schmancy more. Yeah. But I mean, there's the Granada. Yeah, I mean, but that's, that's more of like a fancier place to see a show. You know, yeah. I mean, it's not the same. Um, yeah, so it's like, where does you push out? Like, I feel like if you keep Deep Element, Deep, Deep Element's not going anywhere. Yeah, man. it's not it's, going. It's yeah. not going to die. It's just going to fucking Evolve. take a nap. Yeah, for a little bit. You know, it needs to. Just, this didn't work. Just Bring needs, back the fucking. It bars. just needs to reboot. Um, there is really, really great news for the future of Deep Ellum. That's good. The great news is, is that goddamn school is leaving. 
Which one? The uh, There is a school. That one that's above where Tiki Loco was? And next door to Tiki Loco. It's okay. the whole block. Yeah. Tiki Loco to seven, like the whole block. Yeah. It's a school. And every day at 3 fucking 30, there is a thousand shitty kids just in the street. And their parents are lined up. Yeah. A thousand cars waiting to pick up their kid. And it's a, just a clusterfuck. No one can get in and out of Deep Ellum mm -hmm. for an hour or more. And it just, all it fucks all the business. Um, all these shitty kids fucking go into 7-Eleven and fucking just rob the place yeah. like crazy. Um, they fucking break windows. They've broken tons of neon signs in Deep Ellum. They just, they just, sh they just roll out and shit everywhere. Just Damn. these fucking kids. And it's a fucking melee, dude. You could... Can you imagine, imagine yourself yeah. in middle school or seventh grade or eighth grade, right? Uh -huh. School lets out. You walk out of your school door. Where are you at? The middle of fucking Deep Ellum. Crackheads, bums, yeah. people going to work at bars, bar, 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 bar. Yeah. Why? Why is there school there? Are these kids there? Yeah. It is fucking mm -hmm. illegal. To open a bar anywhere near a school, yeah, like go to the middle school, wherever in the wherever you are, and try to rent the building next door and open a bar. Mm -hmm. You know what they're gonna say? They're gonna say no, <laughs> no, you can't do that. But if there's 100 bars in a three block area, you can just open a middle school right in the middle of it. Damn. How the fuck does that happen? <laughs> the good news is, is the school has outgrown the facility. And they're moving. And they're going to turn, the rumor is they're going to turn all that space into something else, living spaces or something. Yeah, yeah. Um, but the kids are leaving. That's good. And it, it'll, it'll help the neighborhood drastically. It'll help all the businesses. And it'll help, the, I mean, it'll improve the quality of the people that live in Deep Ellum. Mm. Like when you live in Deep, because there's people that live yeah, above yeah. Tiki Loco. Yeah. And every day, every, you live there. And every day at 3.30, a thousand shitty kids are just standing five feet from your fucking window. Yeah. See, I thought that, that was a school because when we had bike night there at Anvil. Yeah. If you I get there I, early. Yeah. You're like, what are all these fucking kids doing here? But it was one of those, uh, now it makes sense because like where your shop is, that, yeah, that would be a major clusterfuck. Even though you have some of the side yeah. streets closer to you. Yeah. But how it backs up. That would be a nightmare for all of Deep Ellum. Yeah, all the way to Cold Brew, dude. Yeah. Um, so they're leaving. I hate them. <laughs> I fucking hate them. So the, at 7-Eleven, yeah. uh, the lady Kim that runs the place, they're so fed up. Their fucking front window has been broken like 20 plus times mm -hmm. from these kids. And they just go in there. So now, every day, as soon as school lets out, it's either her or a security guard standing at the door, letting like five or so kids in at a time, making them set their backpack down yep. and go in. And they're, they're all just, you have to watch every single one of them. Mm. Cause all these kids go in there and just steal everything. Yeah. And so, and when Tiki Loco is open, they would just come into Tiki Loco. And by the end, as soon as they open the door, we're like, nope. Yeah. You know, cause they just come in. And they would go to they would go across the street and buy an ice cream, or go to Seven Eleven and buy a piece of pizza, and want to come and just walk in Tiki Loco and just walk in and sit down. I'm like, yeah. what the fuck are you doing? Yeah. Get the fuck out of here. No loitering. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you can't just come in here and sit down and yeah. eat your fucking food from somewhere else. Come in here with your bag of Doritos. Get the fuck out on the curb. <laughs> um, and it was an it was a menace every yeah. day for hours, and it, it hindered. Yeah. Our business. And it hinders every business down there. And it's just, I'm glad they're leaving. Um, <laughs> it makes sense, man. It is, it's a place for a school anyway, man. You know? Yeah, we're not, we, like, we'll walk down to 7-Eleven, and as soon as we start walking, we're like, oh, fuck. Yeah. It's fucking school let out time. Is, so uh, we walk down there, there's kids everywhere, and they're fucking bullshitting or whatever. And we get to 7-Eleven, and there's a line of them waiting to get in the door, right? We just walk right to the front of the door, and she opens the door and lets in. All these kids start yelling, hey, get in the fucking line. We're like, dude, fuck you. Yeah. You know, I don't say that to them, but I'm just like, whatever. We just go in. We buy our shit. You just leave. walk past them and give them the finger the whole way down. Nah. <laughs> I mean, they're kids. 
But yeah. I'm just like, I'm not going to listen to some kid. Yeah. But mo- the thing about Deep Ellum is everybody that works in Deep Ellum pretty, pretty much knows everyone else who works in Deep Ellum. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, you know how it is. Yeah. If you work in a neighborhood, you give a neighborhood discount to all the other people that work Service in the industry, neighborhood. Yeah. You know, and it's like, so we know everybody at every place. So it's like, I'm going to treat them... Yeah, you're not like going to walk in 7-Eleven and, 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 and be an asshole and shit like that, you know? Yeah, but, yeah I mean, we've been in Deep Ellum a long time, mm-hmm. you know? And it, it is my my home. Mm-hmm. It is my... Those people, anybody that works in Deep Ellum is in my... Uh, you know, I call it... It's like a family group, you know? Yeah. I mean, I'm a very friendly-oriented, you know, personality or whatever you want to call yeah. it. Like, I... I like to see this. I like to be nice to everybody every day. And what even the other tattoo shops are now. I was always like, "Hi, how's it going?" You yeah, know? there's no other tattoo shops anymore. Is there, there is still just the one at taboo the, on Main Street. Right. But at one time, there were seven tattoo shops in Depot. Yeah, I remember Boog. Remember him? Yep. He tattooed a lot of my stuff yeah. back on. Ah uh, man, he was a he was a great fucking yeah. guy, man. Me and him were friends for fucking probably twenty plus years. Yeah, he's a good dude. Yeah. He got it. We got, we became friends a little bit because uh, he was interested in all the airbrush stuff I used yeah. to do because I used to do a lot of lowrider shit back in the day. And of course, he did all that, f- the Chicano style flash. So it was just kind of hand in hand. He'd, he'd, he did my neck and a couple other spots, and I'd show him some stuff with the airbrush and, you know, did that kind of stuff, you know, back in the day. He was a great guy. Yeah. When great he started guy. traveling all over the world because of his flash, I was like, oh, that yeah, was dope. dude. Everybody has his, everybody, at one point, everybody had his flash. Yeah. Um, and he just made hundreds and hundreds of pages, dude. Yeah, hundreds of pages. Drawing, man, that's where it's at. Yeah, pencil and paper. Hey, I'll 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 jump on a fucking train of thought with a pencil and paper, man. Mm-hmm. I've been traveling around, tattooing, you mm-hmm. know, forever. But lately, um, you know, I go to tattoo shops all over and I see, meet new people and meet new younger generation tattooers or whatever, and a lot of people using their iPad. Mm-hmm. to draw and I call it the didgeridoo mm-hmm. you know and they're fucking just fake drawing they're just creating things and you know I don't know if you've ever used oh yeah one yeah they take these images I don't know if you've ever used I have one yeah a procreate yeah. system but you're not really drawing mm-hmm. you're directing something to create a line but yeah. you're not making the line that thing makes that same exact width line yeah perfectly and then if you hold it down it smooths it out and if you make a circle, it oh, makes a perfect circle. If you do a curve, it fucking makes it a perfect curve. Yeah. You know, it's assisted. Yeah. Um, and also, the big thing I say is, like, when you draw, when I draw a tattoo to fit a spot, on yeah. the, this is the spot of the tattoo. It's this big. I trace the spot, you know, mm-hmm. on someone's body. I trace, this is how big it is. This is where it's going to fit. And I draw the design to fit in that spot. And I draw... The detail in that design relative to the size it's really going to be. Yeah. And so when you draw an iPad, they zoom in and draw the eye and then zoom out and spin it and draw the foot and zoom in and zoom out and spin it. The first time that thing ever existed in real life is once they print it out. Mm. And then once you print it out, like, oh, man, that foot's too small. Yeah, yeah. You know, or the detail's too fine for what I'm doing. But when I draw on paper, I use the pen that's relative to the size line I'm going to tattoo with. So I know how much detail can fit in every square inch. Yeah, yeah. And I'm drawing in a relative space that really exists in real life. I'm creating something that actual is handheld and I'm creating actual art. Being said, I had this talk with this kid and I was just like, and he was, you know, making fun of me for being old school and using paper. And I'm like, I started, had to, I was like, look, you want to be an artist. Like, what do you mean? I was like, well, I mean, you're a tattooer, you're an artist, but you want to be an artist. Mm-hmm. You know, there's one thing, like, you're a plumber, or do you want to be a plumber? Yeah. You paint fences, or do you want to paint fences? You're an artist, you want, you know, not every, not everybody's doing something wants to do what they're doing. Yeah, yeah. But you want to be an artist, right? You want to be good at it? If the answer is yes, okay, then the answer is yes. So you want to be good at drawing. Mm-hmm. You want to be an artist? You want to be good at it? to be good at drawing if you want to be good at something what's the answer do less of it do more of it so you're telling me you want to be an artist Mm -hmm. and you want to be good at drawing but you're going to use this ipad that allows you to do less drawing 
Yeah. So what's the long-term effect of using an iPad? Being a better drawer? I don't think so. I don't think that's the long-term effect. I think the long-term effect is you're not going to be better at it. When you, you know, especially since I've done just a small amount of tattooing in my life, when you draw, you... You're learning that muscle memory. Exactly. that. Yeah. Mu so if that line, if you can just hold it down and the line fixes it, then that, that completely knows... This. Exactly. All that muscle memory that goes into your hand... I equate the same as like skateboarding. The longer you skateboard, the easier the tricks become. The longer you hold a pencil, so the, the more. more the, if you want to be good at something, yeah, the answer is do more of it. Mm -hmm. So if there's an item, if there's a, a tool that allows you to do less of it, is that tool helping you get better or not? Yeah. My evaluation is that, that tool is hindering your future ability to be better at what you claim you want to be good yeah. at. So I say, take that fucking didgeridoo and throw it in the trash. I'll tell you exactly. And invest in yeah. paper, pens, brushes, yeah. paint, canvases, real so that's the artifacts. Other thing. That's the other thing. Like Artifacts. A You're lot creating of art with factual things. Yeah. A lot of artists, especially tattooists, would do these like watercolor paintings, these other types of paintings that in those, in I, I don't know if it's still like this, this day, but back in the day when you were in the shop for seven hours a day watercolor. waiting, you would make all these other prints and things like that you would do yeah. or, or work on flash. Well, now a lot of people are just creating things on their iPad and printing it out and calling it art. Yeah. And it's I'm, just, like, I'm like, is that frameable? Yeah. Would you put it on the frame? That's that's is a that good question. You just, you just made a... a, a photocopy of a digital printout yeah is that frameable i don't know yeah to, to what generation does that be, become something i, I would want to hang on my wall but like for me i use an ipad for this uh i draw everything i do even even like all the sketches for the helmet paint jobs and bike like well, that. like the mock-up for the bike yeah so yeah you can load in the dimensions and that's you can, exactly what i do is i'll take a picture of the bike i'll get all the dimensions to me, that makes sense and then i print it out and i'll tell you i'll print out 40 of them and I'll draw everything in it, and then, oh, I didn't like that color scheme. Man, here we go, here we go. But sometimes, uh, you know, could, and a lot of people say, because I showed you that picture of that tank, right? I did yeah. all that with it, with the iPad. It, It's cool. Like, I, I, I'm, I'm glad I know how to do that, but there's just something different about pulling out those Prismacolor color markers. Exactly. It, I feel like I can take those, those sketches of those bikes, and even though they're – their their outline stencils and then I color them in. I still find that to be more authentically real, if that makes sense. And every logo, everything I do, I, I start with pencil. I, I did a video on that on YouTube where I literally showed them like this is this bike, this is this logo I use for YouTube. These are the preliminary sketches. This is how I went from where it started mm -hmm. to this one right here that's digital now for you guys. But this this paper right here is more important to me than that digital product, you know? I keep every sketch up. I got like over 150, 250 Simpson got, helmet sketches. I've got thousands, yeah, of course, thousands <laughs> and thousands and thousands of, of line drawings on yeah. tracing paper from 30 years of tattooing. Yeah, I'm actually putting them all in a book right now. Oh, that'd be rad. Yeah. I think you were talking about that at one point yeah. recently. Where... So, no, no, no clue when that'll come. I don't. I've one thing I've learned is not to predict when something's going to come out because until it's actually ready. Yeah, <laughs> like my podcast <laughs> that I've been working on for. A year and a half now. You've been talking about it for a while. Uh, yeah, but I'm finally recording and I'm finally getting it all down. And uh, as soon as I get a few more episodes in and, and start and get the format all set up, then yeah. it'll it'll go live as soon as. And when I'm not going to announce when it's going live until it's ready to go live. Yeah, yeah. You know, so don't rush it. Yeah. No, but it's gonna be pretty cool. The story, the the stories that you've told me that you have in there, they're not like time based where they need to be out no, by a certain time. Exactly. So. For, for everybody listening out there, sometimes when you do episodes on podcasts, some things are based on, like, this current event right now. So if you take yeah. six months to release it, it's kind of out of the context of when it needed to be released. Yeah, I mean, we're talking about a, an event four weeks from now. We're talking about a movie in two months from now. You yeah. Know, we're talking about, you know, stuff. Something so. you just did, you know, yeah. and things like that. So let me ask you about the book thing, man. Um, I have, out of nowhere, the last couple of months, I've just gotten this like draw towards books, whether they're photo books or, you know, like the bike riders or one of my favorite ones I've gotten recently is a Todd Blueball's uh, book. I don't know if you've ever seen that one. Though. I haven't. Um, uh, Too Far Gone. 
uh, that he did in 2012 when he jumped on a bike for six months and photographed it. Has a lot of short stories about it oh, in there. Oh man, it's an amazing book. I loved it, and that's kind of uh, been a great one to do. But like, I'm just into it, man. Like the concept of, I guess the digital overload has got me to where I, you know, maybe I'm becoming a real vintage kind of guy but yeah i mean i love magazines and 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 books art books yeah yeah you know i like to look you know at at art books yeah you know we have a lot of reference books in tattooing over the course of the years of every kind of art you know mm. to reference yeah you know because people come in like oh i want this like, oh we got a book with that in it you know but uh much better than looking at it on a screen like mm. when you can like look through the images and you know obviously a lot of people make books specifically for artist reference. Yeah, and yeah. those are my favorite books. You know, um, I'm I, I'm not a I'm not a good reader, mm -hmm. um, but I have I have uh, tried to get into some finding some books that have good audio book versions so I could listen to the book. But mostly like photo photography books. I've got you know photography and art books are what I have the most of. Mm -hmm. I don't have a collection of novels. Yeah, I, I'm not a great reader either. Yeah, great reader either. Uh, I'm not really that good at it either, but I've kind of been getting better by having these like photo books that have these shorter, concise explanations uh, of the photo or exactly. quick stories that go along with where that photo is taken exactly. and stuff like that. So yeah. you're along for the ride, but you're getting the. Bit, it's basically like I'm a coloring book kind of guy. You know yeah. what I mean? So. <laughs> But at the same time, it does give me a great like connection to kind of escape for a little bit. But I'm not getting lost in, you know, a, a 40 chapter book. You know, my, I've written, I've my, written, I, I've read those before. But my difficulty in reading is is the retention of knowledge from mm -hmm. the written word. Like I was never good in school because I couldn't. If I read 10 pages, I can't tell you what happened on the first yeah. eight pages. I'm no, I'm you know, I'm just. I. But if I watch a documentary. Mm -hmm. I remember that information for life. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like it, the the visual mm. retention of knowledge is is my strong point. The legible retention of knowledge is gone. Yeah, like I just don't. You know, I can read to the extent where I can read instructions. Yeah, on how to make on how to prepare food or how to put a bookshelf together or something. <laughs> but as far as like reading about history. Yeah. If I read about it, I'll never remember the details. Yeah. But if I watch a documentary on it, I know about it. You know, so it's what's crazy, it feels like a lot of great things that become you maybe not so much documentaries because those are more based on on something more tangible. But it seems like a lot of the great works of movies and of literature become movies. Exactly. It's like you start there and that's where it, it gets Maybe left to interpretation for the way the the reader takes it, or audio book, or whatever the case may be. The kind of person that reads and loves to read, they always say when they see a movie about a great book, they always say that the book is better. Mm. And I'm jealous of that because I can't read the book. Yeah, same. you know, I can't get that experience from the written word. So, mm. I of course, a movie is two hours. A book is, you know. A week and a half. Takes you days and days to read yeah, yeah. at minimum. You know what I mean? It's like so much more information. Like the script of a movie, you take a book and write a short little script where the character says these few lines. But in the book, There's it's like vastly descriptive about every single, like I walked into the room and the feel was bubble. You know, like I've seen these little excerpts, but I just can't, just doesn't work. Yeah, I try to I'm read a story that. and I'm like, wait, who's John? <laughs> you know, like who is this wait what is this just the read? brother <laughs> i don't know what's going on yeah i started reading that zen the art of or the art of motorcycle maintenance thing recently it's a short it's a thin book it's I've not that, that book. book um and the same thing i i, I have I, there's been a couple books i've written i've read recently where i remember everything like i'm like wow well I've yeah never... short little things like yeah. i like the big the big harley bible yeah. You know, I read that thing like full through and like read what year they made this bike and what yeah. colors it came in and, and what, what prompted the evolution of these things. And mm -hmm. like you can read all this stuff about the bikes, but it's like a photo and a paragraph, a photo and a paragraph. Yeah. Yeah. It's not, and I can retain some knowledge like that, you know, but mostly, mostly than, you know, I've spent the last decade, you know, really, 
trying to learn about anti Carla Davidson's. Mm-hmm. You know, I go to swap meets as much as I can, and a lot of what I do at those swap meets is find talk to the old guys yeah. at the tables. You know, when they're selling the part, I'm like, oh man, is this the same as the? And then they'll tell me like, oh no, that part changed in '67, or you know, you learn yeah. this, and it takes a long time to learn all this shit. And then I come home and I look at my bike, I'm like, damn it, that's the wrong lever. You know, and then you get all obsessive and you want to get the right, you know. That's the, you know, a lot of people in the custom motorcycle culture, they get really fucking into uh, tricking out their bike or fixing something or putting, doing different, you know, performance shit or trying to update everything. And, And you can go just as crazy. Oh yeah. On an antique bike trying to be like, damn that brake light switch is the wrong brake light switch you know that fucking taillight lens is, you yeah. know every single little fucking thing because they're you know there's a fucking the same taillight housing the lens changed from one year to the next yeah you know well, that, they, yeah that i mean the way i feel right now doing this bike i it's it's visceral man like it's uh it's so much like it's for lack of a better term, it's like something that's really taken a lot of my computing power of like my attention span, but it feels good doing it. And I feel productive and I'm, I'm getting a lot of good dopamine hits when I see something come together or whatever. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I, I imagine that's the same thing with any type of project, anything you put together, or build it, it's going to tap into that same kind of sensory, if you will, yeah. you know, cause th- this has been, I haven't, the amount of hours I've been putting in on this oh, bike yeah. because I kind of got to do it after work, if you will, is I, I thought I was done with those days you know, <laughs> being up here till two in the morning working. Yeah. Like I thought I was, that was like some late 20 shit that I was, I passed. I'm, I'm going to be home at 10 o'clock every night, you know, and now here I am at one thirty. you know, there's possums running around outside. I'm like the, the nightlife is coming out in this, these fields over here and it's just weird, man. But I'm, just glued so focused on it that it's a uh, it's a it's a great feeling but it's just it's it feels foreign because I, I haven't been there in a long time you know so but it's different you well, know like i wrote at her today the the 72 super glide yeah I mean, that's like right now it's like my favorite motorcycle For real? in the world uh but it's you know that is a, a it's it's almost perfect like mm-hmm. as far as like every part like almost like yeah it's got all the the 72 only shit it's got it you know what i mean there's a few things that are you know mm-hmm. i don't know if it'll ever be a hundred point bike but it's you know original paint everything's original mm-hmm. again there's a couple little specialty little hardware pieces that are for that year only and then they changed and you know just stuff like that and to me that's like it's exciting yeah yeah you know but if you just saw it, you'd be like, "Oh, it's just a, you know, just yeah." Regular. It's it's different for people. Yeah. I, I remember. I don't the, expect anybody else to be as excited about this motorcycle as I am. <laughs> I had this conversation with Danger Dan once. I don't know if it was on his podcast or mine, but you know, what's there's that museum in Maggie Valley, like the yeah, Wheels yeah, of Time. Yeah, Wheels of Time. Um, and I just told him, you know, and I, I've always I, I grew up in the custom motorcycle shit, so it's all about you know aftermarket right or hand you know whatever making it better making it whatever right so i've never had an eye for factory anything it's just never it's not that i can't appreciate it a good looking bike is a good looking bike but you know i can't go to a museum and look at a lot of original things i need to like i'm at the harley museum and the first floor shit is badass yeah, (laughs) yeah the first shit is like oh shit like all the documented history like i can connect to that but when it just becomes like you know the same bike, the same yeah. bike. I need stock seventy two bike, stock seventy three bike, yeah, yeah. stock seventy four bike. There's not much there. It's just like oh, yeah. So but bike. there's like that's the good thing about just the world of motorcycles. Is there's all these different avenues for these different types of more or less personalities within the motorcycle world for you to connect with. Some dudes don't give a shit about any of it. They just want to turn it on and go. And there's there's a there's a life for that on these bikes, right? Um, but yeah, I just I don't know, man. Like I I'm all into the 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 customizing of things like how yeah. can you turn this into and something people do that through the courses so you find an old lady's motorcycle old lady shovel head and you're like oh man it's all original and if you don't know you don't know yeah but well yeah every i mean every year if that bike was ridden a bunch then it got changed yeah because fucking 
Yeah, you have to. The new shit updates, you know what I mean? And if you're going to, if you're bought a bike in 84 and then in 88 it needs a new fucking, you're gonna probably going to, could have put a new master cylinder on it because mm-hmm. they're better than they were. Yeah. You know what I mean? You're going to, you're going to make it better. You're going to put the new shit on it. The evolution of like the FXR world, and even though I've only been a part of it for maybe the last eight years or so now, I think it's now at that point as to where choppers and vintage motorcycles has been because there's just been this uptick of everybody finding these these rare like one of five, one of a thousand kind of FXRs, paint schemes, and all original type stuff. And there's like a a whole like generation or not generation, it's just a whole group of people that are into that, right? Yeah. Then there's a group of people that want to willy these things, and there's a group of people that want to do what I'm doing on it or you know, there's just all these different avenues, but it's like, as we get further and further in time, it's like these bikes that are, don't feel that old yeah. are starting to kind of take on these roles of, all right, I'm looking for a 1984 original uh, Good luck. RD fucking Shit's this. expensive. Yeah, it's all expensive, right? I mean, you can spend more money trying to put a bike back to stock yeah. than you can making it the baddest performance thing in the world. Exactly. Because you find the original fucking shit for that year that probably only was in a few year range, you know, cause shit changed ever so yeah. much. Uh, and it's hard to find, you know, even Dyna shit. Yeah. Even like early Dyna yeah. shit that people took off the way. It's fucking expensive now. Yeah. You know, just. So it, it's like, I don't know. I just see, I see it kind of taking place cause you know, you talking about like this, the 72 and this and that. And, you know, I saw a post today somewhere. Someone was like, Oh, this is a one of one paint scheme from Harley that came this way. And of course we got the FXR Bible right here. So we know everything. Um, I'm like, Oh shit. Like there's, I, I see that that same mentality that you have for the bike is in this world too. And I don't think we're there yet where people are going to be doing that for an Oh one Dyna yet. But you know, uh, uh, what is it? The Sturgis Dyna, I don't think they didn't do a Sturgis 91. One. It was a 91? Yep. It was a Daytona too, right? Well, they made a Daytona and a Sturgis okay. in 91. All right. That was like, uh, you know, it's a, I had one. Mm-hmm. Fucking bad to the bone. Yeah. I would love to, I think one of my favorite FXRs I would never touch is like a Liberty Edition. Yeah, one you, of those. you know they made a Sturgis FXR. No, I didn't. They made one. For real? And it's in the Harley Museum. Because they they made the fucking yeah it's basically like a fucking basically at the time was a was a lowrider yeah you know it was one they pushed to the market yeah um and then they made an FXR and said nah but there's one black and orange damn I thought they would have came out with another one of those uh the collection bikes and did like a Sturgis version of that oh what the new bikes yeah they yeah might. I mean, the 80th, or what is it, the uh, 85th is coming up, so maybe that would make sense for them to do it for that. Yeah, I mean, that, the first Sturgis bike was that they made was 81. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's just the F, F, Shovelhead FXC, right? Yeah. And it was, uh, what, 81 to, 91? I don't know. No, they may. I'm just saying, how long has that been? That's they maybe it's like the 50 year anniversary or something of 81, they'll do it or something. I don't know. Mm, okay, didn't Steve have a, a he Sturgis? bought mine? Oh, he bought yours. Yeah, I had an 81 and a 91. I sold them, mm. I sold them both. Steve bought one, yeah, because I remember he came it. to one of the bike nights with it, and I was like, oh, that was nice. And yeah, it was pretty, it was pretty close. I mean, it was, I would say it was probably a 95% correct bike mm. in pretty, in really good shape. Paint was in good shape. and Yeah. Yeah. The wheels were, you know, the orange stripe was a little faded, but yeah. in pretty good shape. It was, in, it was a pretty clean fucking bike. But the 91 I had was like fucking flawless, real low miles, like 4,000 miles or something. Mm-hmm. The dude I sold it to. Fucking laid it down the first day. Damn. That sucks. Yeah. Yeah, it sucks. <laughs> but it didn't fuck it up that bad, but it yeah. just, it scuffed a few things, you know what I mean? I didn't think, get the tank, but that's good. I think the next, so it'll probably be a year or two before I can do it, but one of the next things I want to do, FXR like this, is I want to do a, so I'm, my birth year is 82, and I've always wanted to do an 82 shovel FXR, but I think I want to, 
like kind of do one all up. Yeah. Yeah. That's what Audra's FXR is. 82? The black and red with the gold pinstripe. Mm, nice. Yeah. Nice. That's her birth year, too. Nice. And I've got the 83 red, all all metallic red with the gold. Okay. But I just, it fell over in the trailer a couple of months ago and the tank got fucked up. Ooh. Yeah, it sucks. Nothing yeah. else but the tank. <laughs> right on the fucking Harley the shield. Vendor. Yeah. Those are the worst. So I don't Maybe know. Maybe you can get can... like a paintless tent guy up in there. Oh no. It's, it's, bad. it's deep. Okay. I mean paint's gone. Oh, okay, yeah. Like it is like it fell over and then went for a long time. Like it's <laughs> it looks like It had a whole gas stop in <laughs> Dude, it looks bad. Um so I'm on the hunt yeah. for a tank. It's a eighty three. Eighty three red red with gold pinstripe tank. Okay. So I actually have an extra, I have like a, I have a whole body set of mm. the lowrider version of that same paint. Mm. Um, but man, that FXR tank's going to be hard to find in good shape. But I, I mean, it could be, I could have it repainted. Yeah, yeah. You know, it can be done. Yeah. I have the decal, an NOS decal. Um, it just wouldn't be original paint anymore. Mm. Let me ask you this. Mm. It's one piece tank. Could you paint just the one side? Yeah, they have a dash down the center, right? Yeah. So you can you can split it at the dash. Paint one side and. Yeah, but if you paint one side, uh, it's gonna it, look. It's gonna be what like glossier and more. You depends know on how good you are. To make it not that good. I mean, people. Yeah. A lot of people do the p- fotinas. Fotin. Well, that's that's an art form that they do. They. Yeah. You know. Um, I just it, wonder how well you can match it. I'm not good at matching stuff, man. I think yeah. Gary is probably one of the best dudes in Texas about matching anything from Harley. Yeah. Um, and then as far as like matching finishes, as far matching as like the sun fadedness, the sun fadedness. <laughs> it's, like, I mean, the paint's really bright, so it's close. It's not. I mean, I, I feel like wasn't. I mean, Scott Chemical Candy was doing a lot of like kind of trying to make it look. I don't think he's done any stock stock stuff. Not stock like that, yeah. but just like the finish though, trying to get some of that more. New old patina yeah. vibe going. I just don't crack, even f- some crackle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know, man. I'm I'm good at a couple things in paint, and I just stick to those. Yeah, flakes <laughs> and uh, flashy shit on top of it. Bang so. bang. Well, shoot, man. I'm I'm excited, man. The bike riders movie is, uh, you know, it's it's just. I'm excited for that. I'm excited for Born Free. I'm excited for. Yeah, keep I'll this whole rest touch. of the year. If we have like uh whenever I figure out what the you know the the bike riders movie premiere party thing is going to be, like tell everybody to bring their bikes out. Oh yeah, blah, dude, blah. We'll, we'll, we'll uh, pack the house. And then born free, man. So the cool we didn't even talk about it, but you've been talking about it. I'm probably sure. But uh, the FXR tour, man. You're yeah. gonna you're gonna ride. How many people are going on that? I don't know how many people are going on a total, but we we found ten builders, and all ten builders are expected no yeah. that's the thing to meet in durango meet in durango and then basically durango harley davidson is putting on a party yeah. that monday night and you're gonna trailer your bike to durango no i'm i'm <laughs> i'm planning if if everything goes well that i'm gonna leave here and go to the run to terralingua oh cool and which is awesome too because the same day that saturday is the Get same some day fried bread actually probably will that same Saturday of that event is when the the um, eclipse is going to be going through West Texas. Oh, really? Yeah. So the October fourteenth, they have yeah. that total eclipse. It's total, I think. No, it's, it's not, not total. The total not, one's in April of next year. That's yeah. right. Yeah, I have There's a guy. A partial one in October, and then a total one's in April. Okay, so I'm hoping to go out there, and I see the path, and I know a couple of really dope areas to shoot photos. I'll be honest with you, I love that Terralingo area, but so this whole cool. bike, I have like. Some of the areas I want to shoot pictures of it are in Terralingua oh, or cool. in the area of Big yeah, Bend yeah, yeah. and all that. So if I can find a way to I haven't been down there in so long. I need to I need to make a trip back. We got a good buddy, uh Adam. <laughs> he just became the the fire chief down there. He texted me the other night. Yeah. And he's now the fire chief of Terralingua, which not a big city, right? Yeah, <laughs> but, yeah. You know, it's somebody from Houston that's he runs the you know, big FXR fan, moved out there. And we we keep telling him like he's he's gonna end up being the mayor of this fucking town before too long, you know what I mean? Hell so yeah. free fried bread for everybody. Hell yeah, he's gonna have to go kill that goat down there in Lajitas or whatever that was. Um, 
but no, it's I like it down there, man. It's like it's it's a it's a trek for from here, you know. It's beautiful down there, man. It is. It's surreal, like how different it is from any other part of Texas, you know. And but yeah, so um, my goal is to go down there, spend that Saturday, and then that next Sunday morning ride up through uh, New Mexico, probably get to Santa Fe or something like that, and, and stay the night there, and then ride into Durango cool. that next Monday. Cool, cool, cool. So we have the. Amarillo on Tuesday is going to be a big party at Amarillo HD, and then a big after party on their little Route 66 uh, bar area. And then Wednesday is when we're hosting the, the Born Free pre-party at Strokers, and then yeah. have the bikes there. And then from Thursday, we'll be riding from here in the shop south, uh, the south route. Hell over yeah. To, uh, well, I can't wait to see all that. That's going to be killer. Um, and everybody check out the trailer to the Bike Riders movie yeah. and get ready. Tell all your friends to go to the movies December 1st. And uh, get on the yellowrosecanyon.com. Check out all the info for uh, Born Free. You can get on the Born Free website. Follow all the links. Get your passes. Yeah, just get them now and get it out of the way. Get your passes to Born Free. Ride in. Um, also, quick little blurb is uh, Lance at Dallas Harley Davidson. Mm-hmm. If you want to go to if you want to go to Born Free just for the day, on Saturday they're doing a ride from Dallas Harley Davidson to Born Free, mm-hmm. where you can you'll get wristbanded at Dallas Harley Davidson, and the whole ride is going to be able to just like slide right swoop in, swoop right in, yeah, nice, that's cool, be coordinated in so people can just go <laughs> and uh, <laughs> um, and then this weekend, man, Nacogdoches, yeah. Lumberjack Hunter Davidson, and then also coming up the Congregation Show in yeah, Charlotte, saw that. North Carolina. I want to go out to that. That is a great show, dude. Shout out to the Prism Prism Boys. They put on a really cool show. They got like, you know, Dice Magazine's a big part of it, and the Harley Davidson out there is a big part of it. And it's a that venue is it's a fucking looking. class A fucking show, dude. It's yeah. like, you know, kind of got that hand built Austin kind of. It's like really a lot of there's a lot of cars. And a lot of, no, I wouldn't say a lot, yeah. but there's not a whole lot of bikes or stuff in the show. It's not like the biggest show, but it's the most well curated, mm. you know, and it's in this it's a great building. experience. Yeah. It's in this building. It's really beautiful. And every bike and every car is set with enough room that you can walk around the whole mm. bike instead of, it, you know, if it's, you know, the bikes are all in a real quick line, you can just, you know. I always say that it's like a, like. Mama Tried does this well where they set everything up yeah. where you can really see everything. Yeah. And, you know, if you want you want people to come and experience these things, so they got to be able to walk around and move and catch yeah. all the it's angles. It's a huge building in there. Yeah. It's like old Ford, Ford Motor Company building. Nice. That, um, but, yeah, every bike in there, you can, like, take a photo of the bike by itself. Nice. You know, without. All other, the background stuff yeah. or in between it. Yeah. So fucking cool in there. And they We put, need to bring something like that back to Dallas, man. Well, there's a lot of shit in the works we'll talk about later. I got some ideas, too, if you if you want to hear them. So. Yeah, I would love to hear them. Yeah, cool. Oliver, I appreciate it, man. Uh, I'm excited for all this stuff, and thank you for all the stuff you do around here in Texas and motorcycling. And one day I'm going to get a tattoo from you. I saved, yeah. I saved some space. Well, also, before I leave, <laughs> thanks to Mike and Grant for yeah, bringing for sure. Free to Texas, dude. And, uh, you know, they're really doing a lot to help motorcycle community. And they do – I mean, they're real community-minded. They're – both great fucking guys and it's Mm. you know i think that the way they do things is is it's top tier yeah really nice dude and they're you know it's a great addition to what's going on in texas yeah for sure man